The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. Chapter One The Voyage Otaheite. About the year 1786, the merchants and planters interested in the West India Islands became anxious to introduce an exceedingly valuable plant, the breadfruit tree, into these possessions. And as this could best be done by a government expedition, a request was preferred to the crown accordingly. The ministry at the time, being favorable to the proposed undertaking, a vessel named the Bounty was selected to execute the desired object. To the command of this ship, Captain W. Bly was appointed, August 16, 1787. The burden of the Bounty was nearly two hundred and fifteen tons. The establishment of men and officers for the ship numbered forty-four, and with the addition of two men appointed to take care of the plants, made the whole ship's crew amount to forty-six. The ship was stored and victualled for eighteen months. Thus prepared, the bounty set sail on the 23rd of December, and what ensued will be best told in the language of Captain Bly, whose interesting narrative we abridge. My instructions relative to the voyage, furnished me by the commissioners of the Admiralty, were as follow. I was to proceed, as expeditiously as possible, round Cape Horn to the Society Islands. Having arrived at the above-mentioned islands, and taken on board as many trees and plants as might be thought necessary, the better to enable me to do which I had already been furnished with such articles of merchandise and trinkets as it was supposed would be wanted to satisfy the natives, I was to proceed from thence through Endeavour Strait, which separates Australia from New Guinea, to Prince's Island in the Strait of Sunda, or, if it should happen to be more convenient, to pass on the eastern side of Java to some port on the north side of that island, where any breadfruit trees which might have been injured or have died were to be replaced by such plants growing there as might appear most valuable. From Prince's Island or the island of Java I was to proceed round the Cape of Good Hope to the West Indies, and deposit one half of such of the above-mentioned trees and plants as might be then alive at His Majesty's Botanical Garden at St. Vincent for the benefit of the Windward Islands and then go on to Jamaica, and having delivered the remainder to Mr. East, or such person or persons as might be authorized by the governor and council of that island to receive them, make the best of my way back to England. Setting sail from Spithead, as I have mentioned, on the 23rd of December, 1787, we arrived early in April, 1788, without any special incident having occurred, in the neighborhood of Cape Horn, round which, according to my instructions, I was to direct my voyage. By no possible exertions, however, could we make way in that route, owing to unfavorable winds. On the morning of the ninth April we had advanced the farthest in our power to the westward, being then three degrees to the west of Cape Deseada, the west part of the Strait of Magellan but next evening we found ourselves three degrees fifty-two minutes east of that position, and were still hourly losing ground. It was with much concern I saw how hopeless and even unjustifiable it was to persist any longer in attempting a passage this way to the Society Islands. The season was now too far advanced for us to expect more favorable winds or weather, and we had sufficiently experienced the impossibility of beating round against the wind, or of advancing at all without the help of a fair wind, for which there was little reason to hope. On the other hand, the prevalence of the westerly winds in high southern latitudes left me no reason to doubt of making a quick passage to the Cape of Good Hope, and thence to the eastward round Australia. Having maturely considered all circumstances, I determined to deviate from my instructions, and to bear away for the Cape of Good Hope, and at five o'clock on the evening of the twenty-second, the wind then blowing strong at west, I ordered the helm to be put a-weather, to the great joy of every person on board. With the wind now in our favor we reached the Cape of Good Hope on the twenty-fourth of May, 
where we remained thirty-eight days, taking in various kinds of stores and refreshments. Setting sail from the Cape, we made straight for Van Diemen's Land, which we reached on the 20th of August, 1788. We remained here a good many days, employed in planting some of the fruit trees which we had brought with us from the Cape of Good Hope, in case they might thrive and be of use to the future inhabitants of the island, whoever these might be. We also tried, but without effect, to have some intercourse with the natives, who had already once or twice received visits from European voyagers. Although they came down one day in crowds to the beach, cackling like geese, and we made signs to them, and also gave them presents, we could not bring them to familiarity. The color of these natives of Van Diemen's Land, as Captain Cook remarks, is a dull black. Their skin is scarified about their shoulders and breast. They were of a middle stature, or rather below it. One of them was distinguished by his body being colored with red ochre, but all the others were painted black with a kind of soot, which was laid on so thick over their faces and shoulders that it is difficult to say what they were like. They ran very nimbly over the rocks, had a very quick sight, and caught the small beads and nails which I threw to them with great dexterity. They talked to us, sitting on their heels, with their knees close into their armpits, and were perfectly naked. Leaving Van Diemen's Land, we steered east-south-east, passing to the southward of New Zealand, and making for the principal object of our destination, Otaheite which we saw on the 25th of October, having, during our passage of fifty-two days from Van Diemen's Land, met with nothing deserving particular notice. One of our seamen had died on the ninth of an asthmatic complaint. The rest were well. On the 26th of October, at four o'clock in the morning, we brought to till daylight, when we saw Point Venus bearing south-west by west, distant about four leagues. As we drew near, a great number of canoes came off to us. The ship being anchored Sunday the 26th, our number of visitors continued to increase. But as yet we saw no person that we could recollect to have been of much consequence. Some inferior chiefs made me presents of a few hogs, and I made them presents in return. We were supplied with coconuts in great abundance, but breadfruit was scarce. Many inquiries were made after Captain Cook, Sir Joseph Banks, and many of their former friends. They said a ship had been here, from which they had learned that Captain Cook was dead, but the circumstances of his death they did not appear to be acquainted with, and I had given particular directions to my officers and ship's company that they should not be mentioned. Otu, who was the chief of Matavai, when Captain Cook was here the last time, was absent at another part of the island. They told me messengers were sent to inform him of our arrival, and that he was expected to return soon. There appeared among the natives in general great good will towards us, and they seemed to be much rejoiced at our arrival. Early in the morning of Monday, before the natives began to flock off to us, we weighed anchor to sail farther into the bay, and moored at the distance of about a quarter of a mile from the shore the ship lying in seven fathoms water. Several chiefs now came on board and expressed great pleasure at seeing me. I accompanied one of them on shore, where I was received with much attention and kindness by the people gathered about, as well as by the chief's wife and sister, who came to me with a mat and a piece of their finest cloth, which they put on me after the Otaheite fashion. When I was thus dressed, each of them took one of my hands and accompanied me to the waterside, and at parting promised that they would soon return my visit. Meanwhile, the natives had been visiting the ship and had brought us plentiful supplies of provisions. The next morning early I received a message from Otu, who was waiting on the beach, wishing to come on board. I sent a boat for him, and he came, attended by his wife, and testifying the utmost pleasure at our meeting. I was surprised to find that, instead of Otu, the name by which he formerly went, he was now called Tina. The name Otu, with the title of Eari Rahie, I was informed, had devolved to his eldest son, who was yet a minor, as is the custom of the country. The name of Tina's wife was Idea. 
With her was a woman dressed with a large quantity of cloth in the form of a hoop, which was taken off and presented to me, with a large hog and some breadfruit. I then took my visitors into the cabin, and after a short time produced my presence in return. The present I made to Tina, by which name I shall hereafter call him, consisted of hatchets, small adzes, files, gimlets, saws, looking-glasses, red feathers, and two shirts. To Idea I gave earrings, necklaces, and beads, but she expressed a desire also for iron, and therefore I made the same assortment for her as I had for her husband. Much conversation took place among them on the value of the different articles, and they appeared extremely satisfied, so that they determined to spend the day with me, and requested I would show them all over the ship, and particularly the cabin where I slept. This, though I was not fond of doing, I indulged them in, and the consequence was, as I had apprehended, that they took a fancy to so many things that they got from me nearly as much more as I had before given them. Afterwards, Tina desired me to fire some of the great guns. This I likewise complied with, and as the shot fell into the sea at a great distance, all the natives expressed their surprise by loud shouts and exclamations. I had a large company at dinner, consisting of Tina and the other chiefs. Tina was fed by one of his attendants, who sat by him for that purpose, this being a particular custom among some of the superior chiefs. And I must do him the justice to say he kept his attendant constantly employed. There was indeed little reason to complain of want of appetite in any of my guests. As the women are not allowed to eat in the presence of the men, Idea dined with some of her companions about an hour afterwards, in private, except that her husband, Tina, favored them with his company, and seemed to have entirely forgotten that he had already dined. Tina continued with me the whole afternoon, in the course of which he ate four times of roast pork, besides his dinner. When he left the ship he requested I would keep for him all the presents I had given to him, as he had not at Matavai a place sufficiently safe to secure them from being stolen. I therefore showed him a locker in my cabin for his use, and gave him a key to it. Meanwhile our people were trafficking with the natives and making their acquaintance. Some of the hogs they brought us weighed two hundred pounds, and we purchased several for salting. Goats were likewise brought us for sale, and I purchased a she-goat and kid for less than would have purchased a small hog. Nelson and his assistant, too, our gardeners, were busy all the while looking out for plants, and it was no small pleasure to me to find, by their report, that, according to appearances, the object of my mission would probably be accomplished with ease. I had given directions to every one on board not to make known to the islanders the purpose of our coming, lest it might enhance the value of the breadfruit plants or occasion other difficulties. Perhaps so much caution was not necessary, but at all events I wished to reserve to myself the time and manner of communication. Next morning, Wednesday the twenty-ninth, I returned Tina's visit, for I found he expected it. He was in a small shed about a quarter of a mile to the eastward of Matavai Point, with his wife and three children, not their own, but who they said were relations. In my walk I had picked up a numerous attendance, for every one I met followed me, so that I had collected such a crowd that the heat was scarcely bearable, all endeavoring to get a look to satisfy their curiosity. They, however, carefully avoided pressing against me, and welcomed me with cheerful countenances and great good nature. I made Tina understand that my visit was particularly to him, and gave him a second present equal to the first, which he received with great pleasure. And to the people of consequence that were about him I also presented some article or other. There were great numbers of children, and as I took notice of the little ones that were in arms and gave them beads, both small and great, but with much drollery and good humor, endeavored to benefit by the occasion. Boys of ten and twelve years old were caught up in arms and brought to me, which created much laughter, so that in a short time I got rid of all I had brought on shore. 
the few days which succeeded were agreeably passed by us in amusements and visits to different places we became quite intimate with the natives and they with us i had usually a number of them at dinner on board the ship and nothing could exceed their mirth and jollity some of my visitors had observed that we always drank his majesty's health as soon as the cloth was removed but they were by this time become so fond of wine that they would frequently remind me of the health in the middle of dinner by calling out king george iri no Brittany," and would banter if the glass was not filled to the brim thus passed on time day after day but though apparently indulging in recreations we were at the same time fulfilling the object of our voyage nelson and his assistant being all the while busy in collecting the choicest breadfruit plants to be carried away with us in my conversation with tina and the other chiefs i likewise obtained much information about the state of otaheite and the neighboring islands and of what had occurred since the visit of captain cook of whom they cherished a very fond recollection preserving with the greatest care his picture which he had left with them i was sorry however to find that the animals and plants which cook had left on the island had been taken little care of tina frequently spoke to me of making an excursion to some of the islands near otaheite one island especially he mentioned to me called ru opau the situation of which he described to be to the eastward of otaheite four or five days sail and that there were large animals upon it with eight legs the truth of this account he very strenuously insisted upon and wished me to go thither with him i was at a loss to know whether or not tina himself gave credit to this whimsical and fabulous account for though they have credulity sufficient to believe anything however improbable they are at the same time so much addicted to that species of wit which we call humbug that it is frequently difficult to discover whether they are in jest or earnest their ideas of geography are very simple they believe the world to be a fixed plane of great extent and that the sun moon and stars are all in motion round it i have been frequently asked by them if i have not been as far as the sun and moon for they think we are such great travellers that scarce any undertaking is beyond our ability we had now been about six weeks at otaheite our ship lying in the harbor of matavai and our collection of breadfruit plants carefully kept in pots on the shore under nelson's management the weather till now had been good and the sea calm but on friday the fifth of december the wind blew fresh from the northwest which occasioned the sea to break very high across the dolphin bank and in the night we had such a storm that i became convinced it would not be safe to continue in matavai bay much longer and i determined to get everything ready for sailing as speedily as i could our surgeon who had been a long time ill from the effect of intemperance and indolence died on the evening of the ninth of december as i wished to bury him on shore i mentioned it to tina who said there would be no objection but that it would be necessary to ask his father's consent first which he undertook to do and immediately left me for that purpose when i went ashore i found that the natives had already dug the grave at four in the afternoon the body was interred the chiefs and many of the natives came to see the ceremony and showed great attention during the service some of the chiefs were very inquisitive about what was to be done with the surgeon's cabin on account of apparitions they said when a man died in otaheite and was carried to the tupapau that as soon as night came he was surrounded by spirits and if any person went there by himself they would devour him therefore they said that no less than two people together should go into the surgeon's cabin for some time i did not endeavor to dissuade them from this belief otherwise than by laughing and letting them know that we had no such apprehensions in the afternoon the effects of the deceased were disposed of and i appointed mr thomas denham ledward the surgeon's mate to do duty as surgeon anxious to quit the harbor of matavai where our recent experience of the weather had proved that we were not safe i sent the master in the launch to re-examine the depth of water between this bay and toaroa harbor he returned in the evening and acquainted me that he found a good bottom with not less than sixteen fathoms depth all the way 
the harbor of Toaroa appearing every way safe, I determined to get the ship there as speedily as possible, and I immediately made my intention public, which occasioned great rejoicing. Accordingly, on Wednesday the 24th of December, we took the plants on board, being 774 pots, all in a healthy state, for whenever any plant had an unfavorable appearance, it was replaced by another. The natives reckon eight kinds of breadfruit tree, each of which they distinguish by a different name. The plants are best collected after wet weather, at which time the earth balls round the roots, and they are not liable to suffer by being moved. The most common method of dividing time at Otaheite is by moons, but they likewise make a division of the year into six parts, each of which is distinguished by the name of the kind of breadfruit then in season. In this division they keep a small interval called tawa, in which they do not use the breadfruit. This is about the end of February, when the fruit is not in perfection. But there is no part of the year in which the trees are entirely bare. The day after taking the plants on board we removed to the harbor of Toaroa. I found it a delightful situation, and in every respect convenient. The ship was perfectly sheltered by the reefs in smooth water, and close to a fine beach without the least surf. A small river, with very good water, runs into the sea about the middle of the harbor. I gave directions for the plants to be landed, and the same party to be with them as at Matavai. Tina fixed his dwelling close to our station. The ship continued to be supplied by the natives as usual. Coconuts were in such plenty that, I believe, not a pint of water was drunk on board the ship in the twenty-four hours. Breadfruit began to be scarce, though we purchased, without difficulty, a sufficient quantity for our consumption. There was, however, another harvest approaching, which they expected would be fit for use in five or six weeks. We received almost every day presents of fish, chiefly dolphin and albacore, and a few small rockfish. Their fishing is mostly in the night, when they make strong lights on the reefs which attract the fish to them. Sometimes, in fine weather, the canoes are out in such numbers that the whole sea appears illuminated. We had not been long in Toaroa Harbor when an event happened of some consequence. On Monday, the 5th of January, 1789, at the relief of the watch at four o'clock this morning, the small cutter was missing. I was immediately informed of it, and mustered the ship's company, when it appeared that three men were absent, Charles Churchill, the chief's corporal, and two of the seamen, William Muspratt and John Millward, the latter of whom had been sentinel from twelve to two in the morning. They had taken with them five stand of arms and ammunition, but of what their plan was, or which way they had gone, no one on board seemed to have the least knowledge. I went on shore to the chiefs, and soon received information that the cutter was at Matavai, and that the deserters had departed in a sailing canoe for the island of Tethuroa. I told Tina and the other chiefs that I expected they would get the deserters brought back, for that I was determined not to leave Otaheite without them. They assured me that they would do everything in their power to have them taken, and it was agreed that the chiefs Oripaya and Moana should depart the next morning for Tetharoa in search of them. Seventeen days passed, during which I received only the vaguest intelligence of the success of the search instituted after the deserters, and during these days our intercourse with the natives went on as formerly. One day, in walking with Tina near Tupapau, I was surprised by a sudden outcry of grief. As I expressed a desire to see the distressed person, Tina took me to the place, where we found a number of women, one of whom was the mother of a young female child that lay dead. On seeing us, their mourning not only immediately ceased, but to my astonishment they all burst into an immoderate fit of laughter, and while we remained, appeared much diverted with our visit. I told Tina the woman had no sorrow for her child, otherwise her grief would not have so easily subsided, on which he jocosely told her to cry again. They did not, however, resume their mourning in our presence. This strange behavior would incline us to think them hard-hearted and unfeeling, did we not know that they are fond parents, and, in general, very affectionate. It is therefore to be ascribed to their extreme levity of disposition, 
and it is probable that death does not appear to them with so many terrors as it does to people of a more serious cast. On the afternoon of Thursday the 22nd, I received a message from Tepehu to inform me that our deserters had passed that harbor and were at Tetaha, about five miles distant. I ordered the cutter to be got ready, and a little before sunset left the ship and landed at some distance from the place where the deserters were. They had heard of my arrival, and when I was near the house they came out without their arms and delivered themselves up. This desertion of three of my ship's company did not strike me so much at the time as it did afterwards, nor did an occurrence, which happened not long after, attract that degree of attention from me which it merited. This was the cutting of our ship's cable one night near the water's edge, in such a manner that only one strand remained whole. I naturally attributed this malicious act to some of the natives, although the uniform friendliness of the Otahetans led me to suppose that the culprits must have belonged to some of the other islands, the inhabitants of which were continually coming and going. The consequence was a coolness of some days between me and the chiefs, as I wished to stimulate them to the discovery of the guilty parties. All their exertions, however, to gratify me in this respect, were unavailing, and it has since occurred to me that this attempt to cut the ship adrift was most probably the act of some of our own people, whose purpose of remaining at Otaheite might have been effectually answered without danger if the ship had been driven on shore. At the time I entertained not the least thought of this kind, nor did the possibility of it enter into my ideas, having no suspicion that so general an inclination, or so strong an attachment to these islands, could prevail among my people as to induce them to abandon every prospect of returning to their native country. The month of February had passed, our people becoming always fonder of the Otahetans, and the Otahetans of them and we had already advanced far into the month of March. It was known that the time of our departure from the island was approaching, and much sorrow was manifested on that account. One day, after dinner, I was not a little surprised to hear Tina seriously propose that he and his wife should go with me to England. To quiet his importunity, I was obliged to promise that I would ask the King's permission to carry them to England if I came again, that then I should be in a larger ship, and could have accommodations properly fitted up. In the latter part of March we were busy with our preparations for departure. On the 27th of the month we began to remove the plants to the ship. They were in excellent order. The roots had appeared through the bottom of the pots, and would have shot into the ground if care had not been taken to prevent it. By the 31st all the plants were on board, being in 774 pots, thirty-nine tubs, and twenty-four boxes. The number of breadfruit plants was one thousand fifteen, besides which we had collected a number of other plants. The avi, which is one of the finest flavored fruits in the world, the aya, which is a fruit not so rich, but of a fine flavor, and very refreshing, the rata, not much unlike a chestnut, which grows on a large tree in great quantities. They are singly in large pods, from one to two inches broad, and may be eaten raw, or boiled in the same manner as Windsor beans, and so dressed are equally good, and the oraya, which is a very superior kind of plantain. All these I was particularly recommended to collect by my worthy friend Sir Joseph Banks. I had also taken on board some plants of the etau and mate, with which the natives here make a beautiful red color and a root called pia, of which they make an excellent pudding. At length all was ready for our departure, and on Saturday the 4th of April, 1789, we unmoored at daylight. At half-past six, there being no wind, we weighed, and with our boats and two sweeps towed the ship out of the harbor. Soon after the sea-breeze came, and we stood off towards the sea. Many of the natives attended us in canoes, Tina and his wife were on board. After dinner I ordered the presents which I had reserved for Tina and his wife to be put in one of the ship's boats, and as I had promised him firearms, I gave him two muskets, a pair of pistols, and a good stock of ammunition. I then represented to them the necessity of their going away, that the boat might return to the ship before it was dark. 
on which they took a most affectionate leave of me, and went into the boat. One of their expressions at parting was, Youra no eatua ti vira. May the eatua protect you for ever and ever. Thus, after a stay of five months and a half at Otaheite, we took our leave of it. That we were not insensible to the kindness which we experienced there, the events which followed more than sufficiently prove. For to the friendly and endearing behavior of these people may be ascribed the motives for that event which effected the ruin of an expedition which there was every reason to hope would have been completed in the most fortunate manner. End of chapter 1 This is Chapter 2 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mutiny of the Bounty by William Bly. Chapter 2 Mutiny in the Ship. Read by John Greenman. About three weeks were spent among the small islands which lie scattered round Otaheite, at some of which we touched. According to my instructions, my course was now through Endeavour Strait to Prince's Island, in the Strait of Sunda, between Sumatra and Java. On the 27th of April, at noon, we were between the islands of Tofoa and Kotu. Thus far the voyage had advanced in a course of uninterrupted prosperity, and had been attended with many circumstances equally pleasing and satisfactory. A very different scene was now to be experienced. Monday, 27th April, 1789. The wind being northerly in the evening, we steered to the westward, to pass to the south of Tofoa. I gave directions for this course to be continued during the night. The master had the first watch, the gunner the middle watch, and Mr. Christian the morning watch. Tuesday, 28th. Just before sunrising, while I was yet asleep, Mr. Christian, with the master-at-arms, gunner's mate, and Thomas Burkett, seaman, came into my cabin, and, seizing me, tied my hands with a cord behind my back, threatening me with instant death if I spoke or made the least noise. I, however, called as loud as I could, in hopes of assistance, but they had already secured the officers who were not of their party, by placing sentinels at their doors. There were three men at my cabin door, besides the four within. Christian had only a cutlass in his hand, the others had muskets and bayonets. I was pulled out of bed, and forced on deck in my shirt, suffering great pain from the tightness with which they had tied my hands. I demanded the reason of such violence, but received no other answer than abuse for not holding my tongue. The master, the gunner, the surgeon, Mr. Elphinstone, master's mate, and Nelson were kept confined below, and the fore hatchway was guarded by sentinels. The boatswain and carpenter, and also the clerk, Mr. Samuel, were allowed to come upon deck. The boatswain was ordered to hoist the launch out, with a threat, if he did not do it instantly, to take care of himself. When the boat was out, Mr. Hayward and Mr. Hallett, two of the midshipmen, and Mr. Samuel were ordered into it. I demanded what their intention was in giving this order, and endeavored to persuade the people near me not to persist in such acts of violence, but it was to no effect. Christian changed the cutlass which he had in his hand for a bayonet that was brought to him, and, holding me with a strong grip by the cord that tied my hands, he with many oaths threatened to kill me immediately if I would not be quiet. The villains round me had their pieces cocked and bayonets fixed particular people were called on to go into the boat, and were hurried over the side, whence I concluded that with these people I was to be set adrift. I therefore made another effort to bring about a change, but with no other effect than to be threatened with having my brains blown out. The boatswain and seamen who were to go in the boat were allowed to collect twine, canvas, lines, sails, cordage, an eight-and-twenty-gallon cask of water, and Mr. Samuel got a hundred and fifty pounds of bread, with a small quantity of rum and wine, also a quadrant and compass. But he was forbidden, on pain of death, to touch either map, ephemeris, book of astronomical observations, sextant, timekeeper, or any of my surveys or drawings. 
The officers were next called upon deck, and forced over the side into the boat, while I was kept apart from every one abaft the mizzenmast. Isaac Martin, one of the guard over me, I saw, had an inclination to assist me, and, as he fed me with shaddock, my lips being quite parched, we explained our wishes to each other by our looks. But this being observed, Martin was removed from me. He then attempted to leave the ship, for which purpose he got into the boat, but with many threats they obliged him to return. The armorer, Joseph Coleman, and two of the carpenters, Mackintosh and Norman, were also kept contrary to their inclination, and they begged of me, after I was astern in the boat, to remember that they declared they had no hand in the transaction. Michael Byrne, I am told, likewise wanted to leave the ship. It appeared to me that Christian was some time in doubt whether he should keep the carpenter or his mates. At length he determined on the latter, and the carpenter was ordered into the boat. He was permitted, but not without some opposition, to take his tool-chest. The officers and men being in the boat, they only waited for me, of which the master-at-arms informed Christian, who then said, "'Come, Captain Bly, your officers and men are now in the boat, and you must go with them. If you attempt to make the least resistance, you will be instantly put to death.' and without further ceremony, with a tribe of armed ruffians about me, I was forced over the side, where they untied my hands. Being in the boat, we were veered astern by a rope. A few pieces of pork were thrown to us, and some clothes, also four cutlasses. And it was then that the armorer and carpenters called out to me to remember that they had no hand in the transaction. After having undergone a great deal of ridicule, and been kept some time to make sport for these unfeeling wretches, we were at length cast adrift in the open ocean. I had eighteen persons with me in the boat. There remained on board the bounty twenty-five hands, the most able men of the ship's company. Having little or no wind, we rowed pretty fast towards Tofoa, which bore northeast about ten leagues from us. While the ship was in sight, she steered to the west-northwest, but I considered this only as a feint, for when we were sent away, Huzzah for Otaheite was frequently heard among the mutineers. It will very naturally be asked, what could be the reason for such a revolt? In answer to which I can only conjecture that the mutineers had flattered themselves with the hopes of a more happy life among the Otahetians than they could possibly enjoy in England. The chiefs were so much attached to our people that they rather encouraged their stay among them than otherwise, and even made them promises of large possessions. Under these and many other attendant circumstances equally desirable, it is now perhaps not so much to be wondered at, though scarcely possible to have been foreseen, that a set of sailors, most of them void of connections, should be led away, especially when, in addition to such powerful inducements, they imagined it in their power to fix themselves in the midst of plenty, on one of the finest islands in the world, where they need not labor. My first determination was to seek a supply of breadfruit and water at Tofoa, and afterwards to sail for Tonga Tabu, and there risk a solicitation to Poulaho, the king, to equip our boat, and grant us a supply of water and provisions, so as to enable us to reach the East Indies. The quantity of provisions I found in the boat was a hundred and fifty pounds of bread, sixteen pieces of pork, each piece weighing two pounds, six quarts of rum, six bottles of wine, with twenty-eight gallons of water, and four empty barracos. We got to Tofoa when it was dark, but we found the shore so steep and rocky that we could not land. We were obliged, therefore, to remain all night in the boat keeping it on the lee side of the island with two oars. Next day, Wednesday, April 29, we found a cove where we landed. This is the northwest part of Tofoa, the northwesternmost of the friendly islands. As I was resolved to spare the small stock of provisions we had in the boat, we endeavored to procure something towards our support on the island itself. For two days we ranged through the island in parties, seeking for water and anything in the shape of provisions, subsisting, meanwhile, on morsels of what we had brought with us. The island at first seemed uninhabited, 
but on friday may first one of our exploring parties met with two men a woman and a child the men came with them to the cove and brought two coconut shells of water i endeavored to make friends of these people and sent them away for breadfruit plantains and water soon after other natives came to us and by noon there were thirty about us from whom we obtained a small supply i was much puzzled in what manner to account to the natives for the loss of my ship i knew they had too much sense to be amused with a story that the ship was to join me when she was not in sight from the hills i was at first doubtful whether i should tell the real fact or say that the ship had overset and sunk and that we only were saved the latter appeared to be the most proper and advantageous for us and i accordingly instructed my people that we might all agree in one story as i expected inquiries were made about the ship and they seemed readily satisfied with our account but there did not appear the least symptom of joy or sorrow in their faces although i fancied i discovered some marks of surprise some of the natives were coming and going the whole afternoon towards evening i had the satisfaction to find our stock of provisions somewhat increased but the natives did not appear to have much to spare what they brought was in such small quantities that i had no reason to hope we should be able to procure from them sufficient to stock us for our voyage at night i served a quarter of a breadfruit and a coconut to each person for supper and a good fire being made all but the watch went to sleep saturday the second as there was no certainty of our being supplied with water by the natives i sent a party among the gullies in the mountains with empty shells to see what could be found in their absence the natives came about us as i expected and in greater numbers two canoes also came in from round the north side of the island in one of them was an elderly chief called maka akavo soon after some of our foraging party returned and with them came a good-looking chief called egijifo or ifo their affability was of short duration for the natives began to increase in number and i observed some symptoms of a design against us soon after they attempted to haul the boat on shore on which i brandished my cutlass in a threatening manner and spoke to ifo to desire them to desist which they did and everything became quiet again my people who had been in the mountains now returned with about three gallons of water i kept buying up the little breadfruit that was brought to us and likewise some spears to arm my men with having only four cutlasses two of which were in the boat as we had no means of improving our situation i told our people i would wait till sunset by which time perhaps something might happen in our favor for if we attempted to go at present we must fight our way through which we could do more advantageously at night and that in the meantime we would endeavor to get off to the boat what we had bought the beach was lined with the natives and we heard nothing but the knocking of stones together which they had in each hand i knew very well this was the sign of an attack at noon i served a coconut and a breadfruit to each person for dinner and gave some to the chiefs with whom i continued to appear intimate and friendly they frequently importuned me to sit down but i as constantly refused for it occurred both to nelson and myself that they intended to seize hold of me if i gave them such an opportunity keeping therefore constantly on our guard we were suffered to eat our uncomfortable meal in some quietness after dinner we began by little and little to get our things into the boat which was a troublesome business on account of the surf i carefully watched the motions of the natives who continued to increase in number and found that instead of their intention being to leave us fires were made and places fixed on for their stay during the night consultations were also held among them and everything assured me we should be attacked i sent orders to the master that when he saw us coming down he should keep the boat close to the shore that we might the more readily embark the sun was near setting when i gave the word on which every person who was on shore with me boldly took up his proportion of things and carried them to the boat the chiefs asked me if i would not stay with them all night i said no i never sleep out of my boat but in the morning we will again trade with you and i shall remain till the weather is moderate 
that we may go, as we have agreed, to see Poula Ho at Tonga Tabu. Maka Akavao then got up and said, You will not sleep on shore, then Mati, which directly signifies, We will kill you. And he left me. The onset was now preparing. Every one, as I have described before, kept knocking stones together, and Ifo quitted me. All but two or three things were in the boat when we walked down the beach, every one in a silent kind of horror. We all got into the boat except one man who, while I was getting on board, quitted it, and ran up the beach to cast the sternfast off, notwithstanding the master and others calling to him to return while they were hauling me out of the water. I was no sooner in the boat than the attack began by about two hundred men. The unfortunate poor man who had run up the beach was knocked down, and the stones flew like a shower of shot. Many Indians got hold of the stern rope and were near hauling the boat on shore, which they would certainly have effected if I had not had a knife in my pocket with which I cut the rope. We then hauled off to the grapnel, every one being more or less hurt. At this time I saw five of the natives about the poor man they had killed, and two of them were beating him about the head with stones in their hands. We had no time to reflect, for, to my surprise, they filled their canoes with stones, and twelve men came off after us to renew the attack, which they did so effectually as nearly to disable us all. We were obliged to sustain the attack without being able to return it, except with such stones as lodged in the boat. I adopted the expedient of throwing overboard some clothes, which, as I expected, they stopped to pick up. And as it was by this time almost dark, they gave over the attack, and returned towards the shore, leaving us to reflect on our unhappy situation. The poor man killed by the natives was John Norton. This was his second voyage with me as a quartermaster, and his worthy character made me lament his loss very much. We set our sails, and steered along shore by the west side of the island of Tofoa, the wind blowing fresh from the eastward. My mind was employed in considering what was best to be done, when I was solicited by all hands to take them towards home, and when I told them that no hopes of relief for us remained, except what might be found at Australia, till I came to Timor, a distance of full twelve hundred leagues, where there was a Dutch settlement but in what part of the island I knew not. They all agreed to live on one ounce of bread and a quarter of a pint of water per day. Therefore, after examining our stock of provisions and recommending to them in the most solemn manner not to depart from their promise, we bore away across a sea, where the navigation is but little known, in a small boat, twenty-three feet long, from stem to stern, deep laden with eighteen men. I was happy, however, to see that every one seemed better satisfied with our situation than myself. Our stock of provisions consisted of about one hundred and fifty pounds of bread, twenty-eight gallons of water, twenty pounds of pork, three bottles of wine, and five quarts of rum. The difference between this and the quantity we had on leaving the ship was principally owing to our loss in the bustle and confusion of the attack. A few coconuts were in the boat, and some breadfruit, but the latter was trampled to pieces. Sunday the third. At daybreak the gale increased. The sun rose very fiery and red, a sure indication of a severe gale of wind. At eight it blew a violent storm, and the sea ran very high, so that between the seas the sail was becalmed, and when on top of the sea it was too much to have set but we could not venture to take in the sail, for we were in very imminent danger and distress, the sea curling over the stern of the boat, which obliged us to bail with all our might. A situation more distressing has perhaps seldom been experienced. Our bread was in bags, and in danger of being spoiled by the wet. To be starved to death was inevitable, if this could not be prevented. I therefore began to examine what clothes there were in the boat, and what other things could be spared, and having determined that only two suits should be kept for each person, the rest was thrown overboard, with some rope and spare sails, which lightened the boat considerably, and we had more room to bail the water out. Fortunately the carpenter had a good chest in the boat, in which we secured the bread the first favorable moment. His tool-chest also was cleared, 
and the tools stowed in the bottom of the boat so that this became a second convenience. I served a teaspoon of rum to each person, for we were very wet and cold, with a quarter of a breadfruit, which was scarce eatable for dinner. Our engagement was now strictly to be carried into execution, and I was fully determined to make our provisions last eight weeks, let the daily proportion be ever so small. Monday the 4th. At daylight our limbs were so benumbed that we could scarcely find the use of them. At this time I served a teaspoonful of rum to each person, from which we all found great benefit. Just before noon we discovered a small flat island of a moderate height, bearing west-southwest four or five leagues, having made a distance of ninety-five miles since yesterday noon. I divided five small coconuts for our dinner, and every one was satisfied. During the rest of that day we discovered ten or twelve other islands, none of which we approached. At night I served a few broken pieces of breadfruit for supper, and performed prayers. Tuesday the 5th. The night having been fair, we awoke after a tolerable rest, and contentedly breakfast on a few pieces of yams that were found in the boat. After breakfast we examined our bread, a great deal of which was damaged and rotten. This, nevertheless, we were glad to keep for use. We passed two islands in the course of the day. For dinner I served some of the damaged bread and a quarter of a pint of water. Wednesday the 6th. We still kept our course in the direction of the north of Australia, passing numerous islands of various sizes, at none of which I ventured to land. Our allowance for the day was a quarter of a pint of coconut milk and the meat, which did not exceed two ounces to each person. It was received very contentedly, but we suffered great drought. To our great joy we hooked a fish, but we were miserably disappointed by its being lost in trying to get it into the boat. As our lodgings were very miserable and confined for want of room, I endeavored to remedy the latter defect by putting ourselves at watch and watch so that one half always sat up, while the other lay down on the boat's bottom, or upon a chest, with nothing to cover us but the heavens. Our limbs were dreadfully cramped, for we could not stretch them out, and the nights were so cold, and we so constantly wet, that, after a few hours' sleep, we could scarcely move. Thursday the 7th. Being very wet and cold, I served a spoonful of rum and a morsel of bread for breakfast. We still kept sailing among islands, from one of which two large canoes put out in chase of us, but we left them behind. Whether these canoes had any hostile intention against us must remain a doubt. Perhaps we might have benefited by an intercourse with them. But in our defenseless situation, to have made the experiment would have been risking too much. I imagine these to be the islands called Fiji, as their extent direction and distance from the friendly islands answer to the description given of them by those islanders heavy rain came on at four o'clock when every person did his utmost to catch some water and we increased our stock to thirty-four gallons besides quenching our thirst for the first time since we had been at sea but an attendant consequence made us pass the night very miserably for being extremely wet and having no dry things to shift or cover us we experienced cold shiverings scarcely to be conceived. Most fortunately for us, the forenoon, Friday 8th, turned out fair, and we stripped and dried our clothes. The allowance I issued today was an ounce and a half of pork, a teaspoonful of rum, half a pint of coconut milk, and an ounce of bread. The rum, though small in quantity, was of the greatest service. A fishing line was generally towing from the stern of the boat, but though we saw a great number of fish, we could never catch one. In the afternoon we cleaned out the boat, and it employed us till sunset to get everything dry and in order. Hitherto I had issued the allowance by guess, but I now made a pair of scales with two coconut shells, and having accidentally some pistol balls in the boat, twenty-five of which weighed one pound, or sixteen ounces, I adopted one, it weighed two hundred and seventy-two grains, as the proportion of weight that each person should receive of bread at the times I served it. I also amused all hands with describing the situation of New Guinea and Australia, 
and gave them every information in my power that, in case any accident happened to me, those who survived might have some idea of what they were about, and be able to find their way to Timor, which at present they knew nothing of more than the name, and some not even that. At night I served a quarter of a pint of water and a half an ounce of bread for supper. End of chapter 2 Section 3 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mutiny of the Bounty by William Bly. Read by John Greenman. Chapter 3 Fate of the Castaways. Saturday the 9th. About nine in the evening, the clouds began to gather, and we had a prodigious fall of rain with severe thunder and lightning. By midnight we caught about twenty gallons of water. Being miserably wet and cold, I served to the people a teaspoonful of rum each to enable them to bear with their distressed situation. The weather continued extremely bad, and the wind increased. We spent a very miserable night without sleep, except such as could be got in the midst of rain. The day brought no relief but its light. The sea broke over us so much that two men were constantly bailing, and we had no choice how to steer, being obliged to keep before the waves for fear of the boat filling. The allowance now regularly served to each person was one twenty-fifth of a pound of bread and a quarter of a pint of water at eight in the morning, at noon, and at sunset. Today I gave about half an ounce of pork for dinner, which, though any moderate man would have considered it only as a mouthful, was divided into three or four. All Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, the wet weather continued, with heavy seas and squalls. As there was no prospect of getting our clothes dried, my plan was to make everyone strip and wring them through the salt water, by which means they received a warmth that, while wet with rain, they could not have. We were constantly shipping seas and bailing, and were very wet and cold during the night. The sight of the islands, which we were always passing, served only to increase the misery of our situation. We were very little better than starving, with plenty in view. Yet to attempt procuring any relief was attended with so much danger that prolonging of life, even in the midst of misery, was thought preferable while there remained hopes of being able to surmount our hardships. For my own part I consider the general run of cloudy and wet weather to be a blessing of providence. Hot weather would have caused us to have died with thirst, and, probably, being so constantly covered with rain or sea, protected us from that dreadful calamity. Saturday the 16th. The sun breaking out through the clouds gave us hopes of drying our wet clothes, but the sunshine was of short duration. We had strong breezes at south-east by south, and dark, gloomy weather, with storms of thunder, lightning, and rain. The night was truly horrible, and not a star to be seen, so that our steerage was uncertain. Sunday the 17th, at dawn of day, I found every person complaining, and some of them soliciting extra allowance, which I positively refused. Our situation was miserable, always wet, and suffering extreme cold during the night, without the least shelter from the weather. Being constantly obliged to bail to keep the boat from filling was perhaps not to be reckoned an evil, as it gave us exercise. The little rum we had was of great service. When our nights were particularly distressing, I generally served a teaspoonful or two to each person and it was always joyful tidings when they heard of my intentions. The night was dark and dismal, the sea constantly breaking over us, and nothing but the wind and waves to direct our steerage. It was my intention, if possible, to make to Australia, to the southward of Endeavour Straits, being sensible that it was necessary to preserve such a situation as would make a southerly wind a fair one that we might range along the reefs till an opening should be found into smooth water, and we the sooner be able to pick up some refreshments. 
Monday and Tuesday were terrible days, heavy rain with lightning. We were always bailing. On Wednesday the 20th, at dawn of day, some of my people seemed half dead. Our appearance was horrible, and I could look no way but I caught the eye of someone in distress. Extreme hunger was now too evident, but no one suffered from thirst, nor had we much inclination to drink, that desire, perhaps, being satisfied through the skin. The little sleep we got was in the midst of water and we constantly awoke with severe cramps and pains in our bones. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday we were in the same distressed condition, and I began to fear that such another night or two would put an end to us. On Saturday, however, the wind moderated in the evening, and the weather looked much better, which rejoiced all hands, so that they ate their scanty allowance with more satisfaction than for some time past. The night also was fair, but being always wet with the sea, we suffered much from the cold. Sunday the 24th. A fine morning. I had the pleasure to see produce some cheerful countenances, and the first time, for fifteen days past, we experienced comfort from the warmth of the sun. We stripped and hung our clothes up to dry, which were by this time become so threadbare that they would not keep out either wet or cold. This afternoon we had many birds about us, which are never seen far from land, such as boobies and noddies. As the sea began to run fair and we shipped but little water, I took the opportunity to examine into the state of our bread, and found that, according to the present mode of issuing, there was a sufficient quantity remaining for twenty-nine days' allowance, by which time I hoped we should be able to reach Timor but as this was very uncertain, and it was possible that, after all, we might be obliged to go to Java, I determined to proportion the allowance so as to make our stock hold out six weeks. I was apprehensive that this would be ill-received, and that it would require my utmost resolution to enforce it, for small as the quantity was, which I intended to take away for our future good, yet it might appear to my people like robbing them of life and some who were less patient than their companions, I expected would very ill brook it. However, on my representing the necessity of guarding against delays that might be occasioned in our voyage by contrary winds or other causes, and promising to enlarge upon the allowance as we got on, they cheerfully agreed to my proposal. It was accordingly settled that every person should receive one-twenty-fifth of a pound of bread for breakfast, and the same quantity for dinner, so that, by omitting the proportion for supper, we had forty-three days' allowance. Monday the 25th. At noon some noddies came so near to us that one of them was caught by hand. This bird was about the size of a small pigeon. I divided it, with its entrails, into eighteen portions, and by a well-known method at sea of, Who shall have this? Note one person turns his back on the object that is to be divided, another then points separately to the portions at each of them, asking aloud, Who shall have this? to which the first answers by naming somebody. This impartial method of divisions gives every man an equal chance of the best share. It was distributed, with the allowance of bread and water for dinner, and eaten up, bones and all, with salt water for sauce. In the evening, several boobies flying very near to us, we had the good fortune to catch one of them. This bird is as large as a duck. I directed the bird to be killed for supper, and the blood to be given to three of the people who were most distressed for want of food. The body, with the entrails, beak, and feet, I divided into eighteen shares, and with an allowance of bread, which I made a merit of granting, we made a good supper compared with our usual fare. Sailing on, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, I at length became satisfied that we were approaching Australia. This was actually the case, and after passing the reefs which bound that part of the coast, we found ourselves in smooth water. Two islands lay about four miles to the west by north, and appeared eligible for a resting place, if for nothing more. But on our approach to the nearest island, 
it proved to be only a heap of stones, and its size too inconsiderable to shelter the boat. We therefore proceeded to the next, which was close to it, and towards the main. We landed to examine if there were any signs of the natives being near us. We saw some old fireplaces, but nothing to make me apprehend that this would be an unsafe situation for the night. Every one was anxious to find something to eat, and it was soon discovered that there were oysters on these rocks, for the tide was out, but it was nearly dark, and only a few could be gathered. I determined, therefore, to wait till the morning, when I should know better how to proceed. FRIDAY THE twenty ninth, As there were no appearances to make me imagine that any of the natives were near us, I sent out parties in search of supplies, while others of the people were putting the boat in order. The parties returned, highly rejoiced at having found plenty of oysters and fresh water. I had also made a fire by the help of a small magnifying glass, and what was still more fortunate, we found among the few things which had been thrown into the boat, and saved, a piece of brimstone and a tinder-box, so that I secured fire for the future. One of the people had been so provident as to bring away with him from the ship a copper pot. By being in possession of this article we were enabled to make a proper use of the supply we now obtained, for with a mixture of bread and a little pork we made a stew that might have been relished by people of far more delicate appetites, and of which each person received a full pint. The general complaints of disease among us were a dizziness in the head and great weakness of the joints. The oysters which we found grew so fast to the rocks that it was with difficulty that they could be broken off, and at length we discovered it to be the most expeditious way to open them where they were fixed. They were of a good size, and well tasted. To add to this happy circumstance, in the hollow of the land there grew some wire-grass which indicated a moist situation. On forcing a stick about three feet long into the ground, we found water, and with little trouble dug a well, which produced as much as our necessities required. As the day was the anniversary of the restoration of King Charles the Second, I named the island Restoration Island. Our short stay there, with the supplies which it afforded us, made a visible alteration for the better in our appearance. Next day, Saturday the 30th, at four o'clock, we were preparing to embark, when about twenty of the natives appeared, running and hallooing to us, on the opposite shore. They were each armed with a spear, or lance, and a short weapon which they carried in their left hand. They made signs for us to come to them, but I thought it prudent to make the best of our way. They were naked and apparently black, and their hair or wool bushy and short. Sunday the 31st. Many small islands were in sight to the northeast. We landed at one of a good height bearing north one-half west. The shore was rocky, but the water was smooth, and we landed without difficulty. I sent two parties out, one to the northward, and the other to the southward, to seek for supplies, and others I ordered to stay by the boat. On this occasion fatigue and weakness so far got the better of their sense of duty, that some of the people expressed their discontent at having worked harder than their companions, and declared that they would rather be without their dinner than go in search of it. One person, in particular, went so far as to tell me, with a mutinous look, that he was as good a man as myself. It was not possible for me to judge where this might have an end, if not stopped in time. Therefore, to prevent such disputes in future, I determined either to preserve my command, or die in the attempt. And seizing a cutlass, I ordered him to take hold of another, and defend himself, on which he called out that I was going to kill him, and immediately made concessions. I did not allow this to interfere further with the harmony of the boat's crew, and everything soon became quiet. We here procured some oysters and clams, also some dogfish caught in the holes of the rocks, and a supply of water. Leaving this island, which I named Sunday Island, we continued our course towards Endeavour Straits. During our voyage Nelson became very ill, but gradually recovered. Next day we landed at another island to see what we could get. 
there were proofs that the island was occasionally visited by natives from Australia. Encamping on the shore, I sent out one party to watch for turtle, and another to try to catch birds. About midnight the bird party returned, with only twelve noddies, birds which I have already described to be about the size of pigeons. But if it had not been for the folly and obstinacy of one of the party, who separated from the other two, and disturbed the birds, they might have caught a great number. I was so much provoked at my plans, being thus defeated, that I gave this offender a good beating. This man afterwards confessed that, wandering away from his companions, he had eaten nine birds raw. Our turtling party had no success. Tuesday and Wednesday we still kept our course northwest, touching at an island or two for oysters and clams. We had now been six days on the coast of Australia, and, but for the refreshment which our visits to the shores afforded us, it is all but certain that we must have perished. Now, however, it became clear that we were leaving it behind, and were commencing our adventurous voyage through the open sea to Timor. On Wednesday, June the 3rd, at eight o'clock in the evening, we once more launched into the open ocean. Miserable as our situation was in every respect, I was secretly surprised to see that it did not appear to affect anyone so strongly as myself. I encouraged everyone with hopes that eight or ten days would bring us to a land of safety, and after praying to God for a continuance of His most gracious protection, I served an allowance of water for supper, and directed our course to the west-southwest to counteract the southerly winds in case they should blow strong. For six days our voyage continued, a dreary repetition of those sufferings which we had experienced before reaching Australia. In the course of the night we were constantly wet with the sea, and exposed to cold and shiverings, and in the daytime we had no addition to our scanty allowance save a booby and a small dolphin that we caught the former on Friday the 5th, and the latter on Monday the 8th. Many of us were ill, and the men complained heavily. On Wednesday the 10th, after a very comfortless night, there was a visible alteration for the worse in many of the people, which gave me great apprehensions. An extreme weakness swelled legs, hollow and ghastly countenances, a more than common inclination to sleep with an apparent debility of understanding, seemed to me the melancholy presages of an approaching dissolution. Thursday the 11th. Everyone received the customary allowance of bread and water, and an extra allowance of water was given to those who were most in need. At noon I observed. I had little doubt of having now passed the meridian of the eastern part of Timor, which is laid down in 128 degrees east. This diffused universal joy and satisfaction. Friday the 12th. At three in the morning, with an excess of joy, we discovered Timor. It is not possible for me to describe the pleasure which the blessing of the sight of this land diffused among us. It appeared scarcely credible to ourselves that, in an open boat, and so poorly provided, we should have been able to reach the coast of Timor in forty-one days after leaving Tofoa, having in that time run, by our log, a distance of three thousand six hundred and eighteen miles, and that, notwithstanding our extreme distress, no one should have perished in the voyage. I have already mentioned that I knew not where the Dutch settlement was situated, but I had a faint idea that it was at the southwest part of the island. I, therefore, after daylight, bore away along shore to the south-southwest, which I was the more readily induced to do, as the wind would not suffer us to go towards the northeast without great loss of time. We coasted along the island in the direction in which I conceived the Dutch settlement to lie, and, next day, about two o'clock, I came to a grapnel in a small sandy bay, where we saw a hut, a dog, and some cattle. Here I learned that the Dutch governor resided at a place called Kupang, which was some distance to the northeast. I made signs for one of the Indians who came to the beach to go in the boat and show us the way to Kupang intimating that I would pay him for his trouble. The man readily complied, and came into the boat. The Indians, who were of a dark, tawny color, brought us a few pieces of dried turtle and some ears of Indian corn. 
This last was the most welcome, for the turtle was so hard that it could not be eaten without being first soaked in hot water. They offered to bring us some other refreshments if I would wait, but as the pilot was willing I determined to push on. It was about half-past four when we sailed. Sunday the 14th. At one o'clock in the morning, after the most happy and sweet sleep that ever men enjoyed, we weighed, and continued to keep the east shore on board in very smooth water. The report of two cannon that were fired gave new life to everyone, and soon after we discovered two square-rigged vessels and a cutter at anchor to the eastward. After hard rowing we came to a grapnel near daylight, off a small fort and town, which the pilot told me was Kupang. On landing I was surrounded by many people, Indians and Dutch, with an English sailor among them. A Dutch captain named Spikerman showed me great kindness, and waited on the governor, who was ill, to know at what time I could see him. Eleven o'clock having been appointed for the interview, I desired my people to come on shore, which was as much as some of them could do, being scarce able to walk. They, however, were helped to Captain Spikerman's house, and found tea with bread and butter provided for their breakfast. The abilities of a painter, perhaps, could seldom have been displayed to more advantage than in the delineation of the two groups of figures which at this time presented themselves to each other. An indifferent spectator would have been at a loss which most to admire, the eyes of famine sparkling at immediate relief, or the horror of their preservers at the sight of so many spectres, whose ghastly countenances, if the cause had been unknown, would rather have excited terror than pity. Our bodies were nothing but skin and bone, our limbs were full of sores, and we were clothed in rags. In this condition, with tears of joy and gratitude flowing down our cheeks, the people of Timor beheld us with a mixture of horror, surprise, and pity. The governor, Mr. William Adrian Van Esty, notwithstanding extreme ill health, became so anxious about us that I saw him before the appointed time. He received me with great affection, and gave me the fullest proofs that he was possessed of every feeling of a humane and good man. Though his infirmity was so great that he could not do the office of a friend himself, he said he would give such orders as I might be certain would procure us every supply we wanted. A house should be immediately prepared for me and with respect to my people he said that I might have room for them either at the hospital or on board of Captain Spikerman's ship, which lay in the road. On returning to Captain Spikerman's house I found that every kind of relief had been given to my people. The surgeon had dressed their sores, and the cleaning of their persons had not been less attended to, several friendly gifts of apparel having been presented to them. I desired to be shown to the house that was intended for me, which I found nearby, with servants to attend. It consisted of a hall, with a room at each end, and a loft overhead, and was surrounded by a piazza, with an outer apartment in one corner, and a communication from the back part of the house to the street. I therefore determined, instead of separating from my people, to lodge them all with me, and I divided the house as follows. One room I took to myself, the other I allotted to the master, surgeon, Mr. Nelson, and the gunner, the loft to the other officers, and the outer apartment to the men. The hall was common to the officers, and the men had the back piazza. Of this disposition I informed the governor, and he sent down chairs, tables, and benches, with bedding and other necessaries for the use of every one. At noon a dinner was brought to the house, sufficiently good to make persons more accustomed to plenty eat too much. Yet I believe few in such a situation would have observed more moderation than my people did. Having seen everyone enjoy this meal of plenty, I dined myself with Mr. Wanjon, the governor's son-in-law, but I felt no extraordinary inclination to eat or drink. Rest and quiet I considered as more necessary to the re-establishment of my health, and therefore retired soon to my room, which I found furnished with every convenience. But instead of rest, my mind was disposed to reflect on our late sufferings, and on the failure of the expedition. But, above all, on the thanks due to Almighty God, 
who had given us power to support and bear such heavy calamities, and had enabled me at last to be the means of saving eighteen lives. In our late situation it was not the least of my distresses to be constantly assailed with the melancholy demands of my people for an increase of allowance which it grieved me to refuse. The necessity of observing the most rigid economy in the distribution of our provisions was so evident that I resisted their solicitations, and never deviated from the agreement we made at setting out. The consequence of this care was that at our arrival we had still remaining sufficient for eleven days at our scanty allowance, and if we had been so unfortunate as to have missed the Dutch settlement at Timor, we could have proceeded to Java, where I was certain that every supply we wanted could be procured. We remained at Kupang about two months, during which time we experienced every possible kindness. On the 20th of July, David Nelson, who had been ill during our voyage, died of an inflammatory fever, and was buried in the European cemetery of the place. Having purchased a small schooner, and fitted her out under the name of His Majesty's schooner Resource, I and my crew set out for Batavia on the 20th of August. We reached that settlement on the 1st of October, where I sold the schooner and endeavored to procure our passage to England. We were obliged, however, to separate and go home in different ships. On Friday, the 16th October, before sunrise, I embarked on board the Vlietje packet, commanded by Captain Peter Couvray, bound for Middleburg. With me likewise embarked Mr. John Samuel, clerk, and John Smith, seaman. Those of our company who stayed behind, the governor promised me, should follow in the first ships, and be as little divided as possible. On the 13th of March, 1790, we saw the Bill of Portland, and on the evening of the next day, Sunday, March 14th, I left the packet, and was landed at Portsmouth by an Isle of Wight boat. Those of my officers and people whom I left at Batavia were provided with passages in the earliest ships, and, at the time we parted, were apparently in good health. Nevertheless, they did not all live to quit Batavia. Thomas Hall, a seaman, had died while I was there. Mr. Elphinstone, master's mate, and Peter Linkletter, seaman, died within a fortnight after my departure. The hardships they had experienced having rendered them unequal to cope with so unhealthy a climate as that of Batavia. The remainder embarked on board the Dutch fleet for Europe, and arrived safe in this country, except Robert Lamb, who died on the passage, and Mr. Ledward, the surgeon, who has not yet been heard of. Thus, of nineteen who were forced by the mutineers into the launch, it has pleased God that twelve should surmount the difficulties and dangers of the voyage, and live to revisit their native country. End of chapter 3 Section 4 of The Mutiny of the Bounty by William Bly This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mutiny of the Bounty, abridged from William Bly's narrative, and other narratives by William Bly. Chapter 4. Fate of the Mutineers. Colony of Pitcairn's Island. The intelligence of the mutiny, and the sufferings of Bly and his companions, naturally excited a great sensation in England. Bly was immediately promoted to the rank of commander, and Captain Edwards was dispatched to Otaheite in the Pandora frigate, with instructions to search for the bounty and her mutinous crew, and bring them to England. The Pandora reached Matavai Bay on the 23rd of March, 1791, and even before she had come to anchor, Joseph Coleman, formerly armorer of the bounty, pushed off from shore in a canoe and came on board. In the course of two days afterwards, the whole of the remainder of the bounty's crew, in number 16, then on the island surrendered themselves, with the exception of two who fled to the mountains, where, as it afterwards appeared, they were murdered by the natives. From his prisoners, and the journals kept by one or two of them, Captain Edwards learned the proceedings of Christian and his associates after turning Bly and his companions adrift in the boat. It appears that they steered, in the first instance, to the island of Tuboai, where they intended to form a settlement, but the opposition of the natives, and the want of many necessary materials, 
determined them to return in the meantime to Otaheite, where they arrived on the 25th of May, 1789. In answer to the inquiries of Tina, the king, about Bly and the rest of the crew, the mutineers stated that they had fallen in with Captain Cook, who was forming a settlement in a neighboring island, and had retained Bly and the others to assist him, while they themselves had been dispatched to Otaheite for an additional supply of hogs, goats, fowls, breadfruit, and various other articles. Overjoyed at hearing their old friend Cook was alive, and about to settle so near them, the humane and unsuspicious islanders set about so actively to procure the supplies wanted, that in a few days the bounty received on board three hundred and twelve hogs, thirty-eight goats, eight dozen of fowls, a bull and a cow, and a large quantity of breadfruit, plantains, bananas, and other fruits. The mutineers also took with them eight men, nine women, and seven boys, with all of whom they arrived a second time at Tubuai on the 26th of June, where they warped the ship up the harbor, landed the livestock, and set about building a fort of fifty yards square. Quarrels and disagreements, however, soon broke out amongst them. The poor natives were treated like slaves, and upon attempting to retaliate were mercilessly put to death. Christian, finding his authority almost entirely disregarded, called a consultation as to what steps were next to be taken, when it was agreed that Tubuai should be abandoned, that the ship should once more be taken to Otaheite, where those who might choose it would be put ashore, while the rest, who preferred remaining in the vessel, might proceed wherever they had a mind. This was accordingly done. Sixteen of the crew went ashore at Matavai, fourteen of whom, as already stated, were received on board the Pandora, and two were murdered. While Christian, with his eight comrades, and taking with them seven Otaheitan men and twelve women, finally sailed from Matavai on the 21st of September, 1789, from which time they had never been more heard of. Captain Edwards instituted a strict search after the fugitives amongst the various groups of islands in the Pacific, but finding no trace of them, he set sail, after three months' investigation, for the east coast of Australia. Here, by some mismanagement, the Pandora struck upon the singular coral reef that runs along that coast, called the Barrier Reef, and filled so fast that scarcely were the boats got out when she foundered and went down, thirty-four of the crew and four of the prisoners perishing in her. The concurring testimony of the unfortunate prisoners exhibits the conduct of Captain Edwards towards them, both before and after the wreck, as having been cruel in the extreme. After reaching a low, sandy, desert island, or rather key, as such are nautically termed, Captain Edwards caused his men to form tents out of the sails they had saved, under which he and his men reposed in comparative comfort but he refused the same indulgence to his miserable captives, whose only refuge, therefore, from the scorching rays of the sun, was by burying themselves up to the neck amongst the burning sand, so that their bodies were blistered as if they had been scalded with boiling water. The Pandora's survivors reached Batavia in their boats, whence they obtained passages to England in Dutch vessels. A court-martial was soon afterwards held, September 1792, when six of the ten mutineers were found guilty and condemned to death. The other four were acquitted. Only three of the six, however, were executed. Nearly twenty years elapsed after the period of the above occurrences, and all the recollection of the bounty and her wretched crew had passed away, when an accidental discovery, as interesting as unexpected, once more recalled public attention to that event. The captain of an American schooner, having in 1808 accidentally touched at an island up to that time supposed to be uninhabited, called Pitcairn's Island, found a community speaking English, who represented themselves as the descendants of the mutineers of the bounty, of whom there was still one man, of the name of Alexander Smith, alive amongst them. Intelligence of this singular circumstance was sent by the American captain, Folger, to Sir Sidney Smith of Valparaiso, and by him transmitted to the Lords of the Admiralty. 
but the government was at that time perhaps too much engaged in the events of the Continental War to attend to the information, nor was anything further heard of this interesting little society until 1814. In that year, two British men-of-war, cruising in the Pacific, made Pitcairn's Island, and on nearing the shore saw plantations regularly and orderly laid out. Soon afterwards they observed a few natives coming down a steep descent with their canoes on their shoulders, and in a few minutes perceived one of these little vessels darting through a heavy surf and paddling off towards the ships. But their astonishment may be imagined when, on coming alongside, they were hailed in good English with, "'Won't you heave us a rope now?' This being done, a young man sprang up the side with extraordinary activity, and stood on the deck before them. In answer to the question, "'Who are you?' he replied that his name was Thursday October Christian, son of the late Fletcher Christian, by an Otahetan mother, that he was the firstborn on the island, and was so named because he was born on a Thursday in October. All this sounded singular and incredible in the ears of the British captains, Sir Thomas Staines and Mr. Pippin, but they were soon satisfied of its truth. Young Christian was at this time about twenty-four years old, a tall, handsome youth, fully six feet high, with black hair and an open, interesting English countenance. As he wore no clothes except a piece of cloth round his loins, and a straw hat ornamented with black cock's feathers, his fine figure and well-shaped muscular limbs were displayed to great advantage, and attracted general admiration. His body was much tanned by exposure to the weather, but although his complexion was somewhat brown, it wanted that tinge of red peculiar to the natives of the Pacific. He spoke English correctly, both in grammar and pronunciation, and his frank and ingenuous deportment excited in every one the liveliest feelings of compassion and interest. His companion was a fine, handsome youth of seventeen or eighteen years of age, named George Young, son of one of the Bounty's midshipmen. The youths expressed great surprise at everything they saw, especially a cow, which they had supposed to be either a huge goat or a horned sow, having never seen any other quadrupeds. When questioned concerning the Bounty, they referred the captains to an old man on shore, the only surviving Englishman whose name, they said, was John Adams, but who proved to be the identical Alexander Smith before mentioned, having changed his name from some caprice or other. The officers went ashore with the youths, and were received by old Adams, as we shall now call him, who conducted them to his house, and treated them to an elegant repast of eggs, fowl, yams, plantains, breadfruit, etc., they now learned from him an account of the fate of his companions, who with himself preferred accompanying Christian in the bounty to remaining at Otaheite, which account agreed with that he afterwards gave at greater length to Captain Beechey in 1825. Our limits will not permit us to detail all the interesting particulars at length, as we could have wished, but they are in substance as follows. It was Christian's object, in order to avoid the vengeance of the British law, to proceed to some unknown and uninhabited island, and the Marquesas Islands were first fixed upon. But Christian, on reading Captain Carteret's account of Pitcairn Island, thought it better adapted for the purpose, and shaped his course thither. Having landed and traversed it, they found it every way suitable to their wishes, possessing water, wood, a good soil, and some fruits. Having ascertained all this, they returned on board, and having landed their hogs, goats, and poultry, and gutted the ship of everything that could be useful to them, they set fire to her, and destroyed every vestige that might lead to the discovery of their retreat. This was on the 23rd of January, 1790. The island was then divided into nine equal portions amongst them, a suitable spot of neutral ground being reserved for a village. The poor Otahetans, now found themselves reduced to the condition of mere slaves. But they patiently submitted, and everything went on peaceably for two years. About that time Williams, one of the seamen, having the misfortune to lose his wife, forcibly took the wife of one of the Otahetans, which, together with their continued ill-usage, so exasperated the latter, 
that they formed a plan for murdering the whole of their oppressors. The plot, however, was discovered and revealed by the Englishmen's wives, and two of the Hotahetans were put to death. But the surviving natives soon afterwards matured a more successful conspiracy, and in one day murdered five of the Englishmen, including Christian. Adams and Young were spared at the intercession of their wives, and the remaining two, McCoy and Quintal, escaped to the mountains, whence, however, they soon rejoined their companions. But the further career of these two villains was short. McCoy, having been bred up in a Scottish distillery, succeeded in extracting a bottle of ardent spirits from the root, from which time he and Quintal were never sober, until the former became delirious and committed suicide by jumping over a cliff. Quintal, being likewise almost insane with drinking, made repeated attempts to murder Adams and Young, until they were absolutely compelled, for their own safety, to put him to death. Adams and Young were at length the only surviving males who had landed on the island, and being both of a serious turn of mind, and having time for reflection and repentance, they became extremely devout. Having saved a Bible and a prayer-book from the bounty, they now performed family worship morning and evening, and addressed themselves to training up their own children and those of their unfortunate companions in piety and virtue. Young, however, was soon carried off by an asthmatic complaint, and Adams was thus left to continue his pious labors alone. At the time Captain Staines and Pippin visited the island, this interesting little colony consisted of about forty-six persons, mostly grown-up young people, all living in harmony and happiness together, and not only professing but fully understanding and practicing the precepts and principles of the Christian religion, while Adams had instituted the ceremony of marriage. The visitors, having supplied these interesting people with some tools, kettles, and other articles, took their leave. The account which they transmitted home of this newly discovered colony was, strange to say, as little attended to by government as that of Captain Folger, and nothing more was heard of Adams and his family for nearly twelve years, when in 1825 Captain Beechey in the Blossom, bound on a voyage of discovery to Bering Strait, touched at Pitcairn's Island. On the approach of the Blossom a boat came off under all sail towards the ship, containing old Adams and ten of the young men of the island. After requesting and obtaining leave to come on board, the young men sprang up the side and shook every officer cordially by the hand. Adams, who was grown very corpulent, followed more leisurely. He was dressed in a sailor's shirt and trousers, with a low-crowned hat, which he held in his hand in sailor fashion, while he smoothed down his bald forehead when addressed by the officers of the Blossom. The little colony had now increased to about sixty-six, including an English sailor of the name of John Buffett, who, at his own earnest desire, had been left by a whaler. In this man the society luckily found an able and willing schoolmaster. He instructed the children in reading, writing, and arithmetic, and devoutly cooperated with old Adams in affording religious instruction to the community. The officers of the Blossom went ashore, and were entertained with a sumptuous repast at young Christians, the table being spread with plates, knives, and forks. Buffett said grace in an emphatic manner, and so strict were they in this respect that it was not deemed proper to touch a morsel of bread without saying grace both before and after it. The officers slept in the house all night, their bedclothing and sheets consisting of the native cloth made of the native mulberry tree. The only interruption to their repose was the melody of the evening hymn, which was chanted together by the whole family after the lights were put out, and they were awakened at early dawn by the same devotional ceremony. On Sabbath the utmost decorum was attended to, and the day was passed in regular religious observances. In consequence of a representation made by Captain Beechey, the British government sent out Captain Waldegrave in 1830 in the Serengapitam, with a supply of sailors' blue jackets and trousers, flannels, stockings and shoes, women's dresses, spades, mattocks, shovels, pickaxes, trowels, rakes, etc. He found their community increased to about seventy-nine, 
all exhibiting the same unsophisticated and amiable characteristics as we have before described. Other two English gentlemen had settled amongst them, one of them, Nobbs, a missionary. The patriarch Adams, it was found, had died in March, 1829, aged sixty-five. While on his deathbed, he had called the heads of families together and urged upon them to elect a chief. Captain Waldegrave thought that the island, which is about four miles square, might be able to support a thousand persons, upon reaching which number they would naturally emigrate to other islands. In 1856 the British government thought it advisable to deport the whole of the inhabitants to the number of 194 to Norfolk Island, about 900 miles east-northeast of Sydney. This island had long been used as a convict prison, but the establishment had that year been broken up. The colonists were provided in their new quarters with houses, domestic animals, implements, seeds, boats, etc. In the end of the following year they were visited by the governor of New South Wales, who organized a magistracy among them, and established a code of laws. They had increased to two hundred and twelve. He found it necessary to introduce a few skilled workmen from England to teach them certain indispensable trades, and also a schoolmaster. On his second visit, in 1859, the governor found that two families, numbering sixteen persons, had returned to Pitcairn's Island, and that others were thinking of following the example. This tendency he succeeded in checking. In 1862, the community had increased to 280 persons, and European usages were slowly spreading. Subsequent reports represent a steady advance in numbers and prosperity. End of chapter 4. Fate of the Mutineers, Colony of Pitcairn's Island. Read by John Greenman. This is section 5 of Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter 1. On Board a Warship. I was born at Wanstead, in Essex, about seven miles from London, in the year 1798. My father, having died while I was young, I was, along with a brother and sister, left to the charge of my mother, who, marrying again, transferred us to the house of her husband, a carpenter by occupation, at Bladen, near Woodstock, and in the employ of the Duke of Marlborough. My father-in-law appeared to be in comfortable circumstances. He resided in a neat house, built of stone, shaded by a noble apricot tree, and ornamented with a small but pretty garden. This, together with another similar tenement, was his own property. To add to my satisfaction, I perceived that he was kind to my mother, and also to myself. With the country around I was equally well pleased. Fine farms, with large flocks of sheep quietly grazing on the hillsides, fields surrounded with fragrant hawthorn hedges, and old farmhouses with their thatched roofs and massive ricks, met the eye on all sides, while cultivated gardens and numerous wild flowers added their charms to the scene. At Bladen my time flew very rapidly away for two or three years, until, like most children, I began to sigh for deliverance from the restraints of home. I had already left school, and being now about thirteen years of age, had been employed in the pleasure grounds of Blenheim Castle. This, however, was too tame an occupation for a lad of my spirits. I heard tales of the sea from cousins with whom I had resided for a short time. My imagination painted a life on the great deep in the most glowing colors. My mind grew uneasy. And, in short, like many other heedless lads, I resolved on being a sailor. Finding my desire so strong, my kind-hearted mother made interest to have me taken on board a ship of war, a matter not difficult in those times, and on the twelfth day of July, 1810, I turned my back on the quiet hamlet of Bladen, and my face toward scenes of noise, dissipation, storms, and danger. My mother accompanied me in the stagecoach to London, and then, taking a boat, we proceeded down the Thames to a spot below Gravesend, where lay the Macedonian, the frigate on which I was to be put aboard. 
need I say that, when left by my mother on the deck of the vessel, tears were mutually shed, and when the departing boat carried her from my sight, I felt like one alone in the world. On the morning after my arrival I was put into a mess. The crew of a man-of-war is divided into little communities of about eight each, called messes. These eat and drink together, and are, as it were, so many families. The mess to which I was introduced was composed of your genuine weather-beaten old tars, but for one of its members it would have suited me very well. This one, a gruff old fellow named Hudson, took it into his head to hate me at first sight. He treated me with so much abuse and unkindness that my messmates soon advised me to change my mess, a privilege which is wisely allowed, and which tends very much to the good fellowship of a ship's crew. For if there are disagreeable men among them, they can in this way be got rid of. It is no unfrequent case to find a few who have been spurned from all the messes in the ship obliged to mess by themselves. This unkindness from the brutal Hudson rather chilled my enthusiasm. The crew, too, by some means had an impression that my mother had brought me on board to get rid of me, and therefore bitterly abused her. Swearing I had heard before, but never such as I heard there. Nor was this all. In performing the work assigned me, which consisted in helping the seamen to take in provisions, powder, shot, etc., I felt the insults and tyranny of the midshipmen. These minions of power ordered and drove me round like a dog, nor did I and the other boys dare to interpose a word. These things reminded me of what had been said to me of the hardships of sea life in a man of war. I began to wish myself back in my father's house at Bladen. This, however, was impossible, and to add to my discouragement, they told me I was entered on the ship's books for life. Dreary prospect! But, although somewhat grieved with my first experience of sailor life, I secretly struggled against my feelings, and with the most philosophic desperation resolved to make the best of my condition. We were kept busily at work every day until the ship's stores were all on board, and our frigate was ready for sea. Then two hundred more men, drafted from receiving ships, came on board to complete the number of our crew, which, after this addition, amounted to full three hundred men. The jocularity, pleasantry, humor, and good feeling that now prevailed on board our frigate somewhat softened the unpleasantness of my lot, and cultivated a feeling of reconciliation to my circumstances. Various little friendships which sprang up between me and my shipmates threw a gleam of gladness across my path. A habit of attention, respect, and obedience, in a short time, secured me universal goodwill. I began to be tolerably satisfied. Many boys complain of ill-usage at sea. I know they are subjected to it in many instances, yet in most cases they owe it to their own boldness. A boy on shipboard who is habitually saucy will be kicked and cuffed by all with whom he has to do. He will be made miserable. The reason is, I imagine, that sailors being treated as inferiors themselves love to find the opportunity to act the superior over someone. They do this over the boys, and if they find a saucy, insolent one, they show him no mercy. Permit me then to advise boys who go to sea to be civil and obliging to all. They will be amply repaid for the effort it may cost them to make the trial, especially if they gain the reputation, as I did, of being among the best boys in the ship. A vessel of war contains a little community of human beings, isolated for the time being, from the rest of mankind. This community is governed by laws peculiar to itself. It is arranged and divided in a manner suitable to its circumstances. Hence, when its members first come together, each one is assigned his respective station and duty. For every task, from getting up the anchor to unbending the sails aloft and below, at the mess-table or in the hammock, each task has its man, and each man his place. A ship contains a set of human machinery, in which every man is a wheel, a band, or a crank, all moving with wonderful regularity and precision to the will of its machinist, the all-powerful captain. 
The men are distributed in all parts of the vessel. Those in the tops are called foretopmen, main topmen, and mizzen topmen, with two captains to each top, one for each watch. These topmen have to loose, take in, reef, and furl the sails aloft, such as the topgallant sails, top sails, topgallant royal, and top sail studding sails. Others are called forecastle men, wasters, and the afterguard. These have to loose, tend, and furl the courses, that is, the foresail, the mainsail, the lower studding sails. They also have to set the jib, flying jib, and spanker. The afterguard have a special charge to coil up all ropes in the after part of the ship. Others are called scavengers. These, as their not very attractive name imports, have to sweep and pick up the dirt that may chance to gather through the day, and throw it overboard. Then come the boys, who are mostly employed as servants to the officers. Our captain had a steward and a boy. These acted as his domestic servants in his large and stately cabin, which, to meet the ideas of landsmen, may be called his house. The lieutenants, purser, surgeon, and sailing-master, had each a boy. They, together with the two lieutenants of marines, who were waited upon by two marines, form what is called the wardroom officers. The wardroom is a large cabin, I mean large for a ship, of course, below the captains, where they all mess together. After this cabin is a smaller one, which serves as a species of storeroom. Besides these accommodations, every wardroom officer has his stateroom, containing his cot, washstand, writing desk, clothes, etc. The gunner, boatswain, and some others are also allowed a boy, and a man and boy are appointed to be the servants of a certain number of midshipmen. Another arrangement is that of forming the ship's company into watches. The captain, first lieutenant, surgeon, purser, boatswain, gunner, carpenter, armorer, together with the stewards and boys, are excused from belonging to them, but are liable to be called out to take in sail. Some of the last mentioned are called idlers. All others are in watches, called the larboard and starboard watches. Stations are also assigned at the guns to the whole crew. When at sea, the drummer beats to quarters every night. This beat is a regular tune. I have often heard the words sung which belong to it. This is the chorus. Hearts of oak are our ships, jolly tars are our men. We always are ready, steady, boys, steady, to fight and to conquer again and again. At the roll of this evening drum, all hands hurry to the guns. Eight men and a boy are stationed at each gun, one of whom is captain of the gun, another sponges and loads it, the rest take hold of the side tackle falls to run the gun in and out while the boy is employed in handing the cartridges for which he is honored with the name powder monkey besides these arrangements among the men there are from thirty to forty marines to be disposed of these do duty as sentries at the captain's cabin the wardroom and at the galley during the time of cooking they are also stationed at the large guns at night as far as their numbers run when a ship is in action and small arms can be brought to bear on the enemy they are stationed on the spar deck they are also expected to assist in boarding in conjunction with several seamen from each gun who are armed with pistols and pikes and called boarders the great disparity of numbers between the crew of a merchant ship and that of a man of war occasions a difference in their internal arrangements and mode of life scarcely conceivable by those who have not seen both this is seen throughout from the act of rousing the hands in the morning to that of taking in sail in the merchantman the watch below is called up by a few strokes of the handspike on the forecastle in the man of war by the boatswain and his mates the boatswain is a petty officer of considerable importance in his way he and his mates carry a small silver whistle or pipe suspended from the neck by a cord he receives word from the officer of the watch to call the hands up. You immediately hear a sharp, shrill whistle. This is succeeded by another, and another from his mates. Then follows his hoarse rough cry of, All hands ahoy! 
which is forthwith repeated by his mates. Scarcely has this sound died upon the ear before the cry of, Up all hammocks, ahoy! succeeds it to be repeated in like manner. As the first tones of the whistle penetrate between decks, signs of life make their appearance. Rough, uncouth forms are seen tumbling out of their hammocks on all sides, and before its last sounds have died away, the whole company of sleepers are hurriedly preparing for the duties of the day. No delay is permitted, for as soon as the before-mentioned officers have uttered their imperative commands, they run below, each armed with a rope's end, with which they belabor the shoulders of any luckless wight upon whose eyes sleep yet hangs heavily, or whose slow-moving limbs show him to be but half awake. With a rapidity which would surprise a landsman, the crew dress themselves, lash their hammocks, and carry them on deck, where they are stowed for the day. There is a system even in this arrangement. Every hammock has its appropriate place. Below the beams are all marked. Each hammock is marked with a corresponding number, and in the darkest night a sailor will go unhesitatingly to his own hammock. They are also kept exceedingly clean. Every man is provided with two, so that while he is scrubbing and cleaning one, he may have another to use. Nothing but such precautions could enable so many men to live in so small a space. A similar rapidity attends the performance of every duty. The word of command is given in the same manner, and its prompt obedience enforced by the same unceremonious rope's end. To skulk is therefore next to impossible. The least tardiness is rebuked by the cry of, Hurrah, my hearty! Bear a hand! Heave along! Heave along! This system of driving is far from being agreeable. It perpetually reminds you of your want of liberty. It makes you feel sometimes as if the hardest crust the most ragged garments with the freedom of your own native hills would be preferable to john bull's beef and duff joined as it is with the rope's end of the driving boatswain we had one poor fellow an irishman named billy garvey who felt very uneasy and unhappy he was the victim of that mortifying system of impressment prevalent in great britain in time of war he came on board perfectly unacquainted with the mysteries of sea life one of his first inquiries was where he should find his bed, supposing they slept on shipboard on beds the same as on shore. His messmates, with true sailor roguishness, sent him to the boatswain. "'And where shall I find a bed, sir?' asked he of this rugged son of the ocean. The boatswain looked at him very contemptuously for a moment, then, rolling his lump of tobacco into another apartment of his ample mouth, replied, "'Have you got a knife?' Yes, sir. Well, stick it into the softest plank in the ship, and take that for a bed. As our fare was novel and so different from shore living, it was some time before I could get fully reconciled to it. It was composed of hard sea biscuit, fresh beef while in port, but salt pork and salt beef at sea, pea soup and burgoo. Burgoo, or as it was sportively called, skilligalee, was oatmeal boiled in water to the consistency of hasty pudding. Sometimes we had cocoa instead of burgoo. Once a week we had flour and raisins served out, with which we made duff, or pudding. To prepare these articles each mess had its cook, who drew the provisions, made the duff, washed the mess kids, etc. He also drew the grog for the mess, which consisted of a gill of rum mixed with two gills of water for each man. This was served out at noon every day. At four o'clock p.m. each man received half a pint of wine. The boys only drew half this quantity, but were allowed pay for the remainder, a regulation which could have been profitably applied to the whole supply of grog and wine for both boys and men. But those were not days in which temperance triumphed as she does now. Shortly after our captain came on board, his servant died somewhat suddenly so that I had an early opportunity of seeing how sailors are disposed of in this sad hour. The corpse was laid out on the grating, covered with a flag. As we were yet in the river, the body was taken on shore and buried, without the burial service of the Church of England being read at the grave, a ceremony which is not omitted at the internment of the veriest pauper in that country. 
I have purposely dwelt on these particulars, that the reader may feel himself initiated at once into the secrets of man-of-war usages. He has doubtless seen ships of war with their trim rigging and frowning ports, and his heart has swelled with pride as he has gazed upon these floating cities, the representatives of his nation's character in foreign countries. To their internal arrangements, however, he has been a stranger. I have endeavored to introduce him into the interior. A desire to make him feel at home there is my apology for dwelling so long on these descriptions. End of chapter 1 This is section 6 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter 2 Flogging A Foreign Cruise. After various delays, we were at last ready for sea and under sailing orders. The tide and wind were both propitious. Then came the long expected cry of the boatswain. All hands up anchor, ahoy! The crew manned the capstan in a trice, and running round to the tune of a lively air played by the fifer, the huge anchor rapidly left the mud of the Thames, and hung at the bows of our frigate. Then came the cry of, All hands make sail, ahoy! As if by magic, she was immediately covered with canvas. The favoring breeze at once filled our sails and the form that had lain for weeks inert and motionless on the waters now bounded along the waves like a thing of life. Rapidly we ran down the channel, and before we had well got under way, came to an anchor again at Spithead, under shelter of the Isle of Wight. Short as was the period between weighing anchor off Gravesend and our arrival at Spithead, it gave opportunity for one of those occurrences which are a disgrace to the naval service of any nation, and a degradation to our common humanity, which the public opinion of the civilized world should frown out of existence. I allude to the brutal practice of flogging. A poor fellow had fallen into the very sailor-like offense of getting drunk. For this, the captain sentenced him to the punishment of four dozen lashes. He was first placed in irons all night. The irons used for this purpose were shackles fitting round the ankles, through the ends of which was passed an iron bar some ten or twelve feet in length. It was thus long, because it was no infrequent ease for half a dozen men to be ironed at once. A padlock at the end of the bar held the prisoner securely. Thus placed, he was guarded by a marine until the captain bade the first lieutenant prepare the hands to witness the punishment. Upon this the lieutenant transmitted the order to the master-at-arms. He then ordered the grating or hatch full of square holes to be rigged, and was placed accordingly between the main and spar decks, not far from the main mast. While these preparations were going on, the officers were dressing in full uniform and arming themselves with their dirks. The prisoner's messmates carried him his best clothes to make him appear in as decent a manner as possible. This is always done in the hope of moving the feelings of the captain favorably towards the prisoner. This done, the hoarse, dreaded cry of, All hands ahoy to witness punishment, from the lips of the boatswain, pealed along the ship as mournfully as the notes of a funeral knell. At this signal the officers mustered on the spar deck, the men on the main deck. Next came the prisoner guarded by a marine on one side, and the master at arms on the other. He was marched up to the grating. His back was made bare, and his shirt laid loosely upon his back. The two quartermasters proceeded to seize him up, that is, they tied his hands and feet with spun yarns, called the seizings, to the grating. The boatswain's mates, whose office it is to flog on board a man of war, stood ready with their dreadful weapon of punishment, the cat o' nine tails. This instrument of torture was composed of nine cords, a quarter of an inch round, and about two feet long, the ends tipped with fine twine. To these cords was affixed a stock two feet in length, covered with red baize. The reader may be sure that it is a most formidable instrument in the hands of a strong, skillful man. Indeed, any man who should whip his horse with it would commit an outrage on humanity which the moral feeling of any community would not tolerate. 
he would be prosecuted for cruelty. The boatswain's mate is ready, with coat off and whip in hand. The captain gives the word. Carefully spreading the cords with the fingers of his left hand, the executioner throws the cat over his right shoulder. It is brought down upon the now uncovered Herculean shoulders of the man. His flesh creeps. It reddens as if blushing at the indignity. The sufferer groans. Lash follows lash, until the first mate, wearied with the cruel employment, gives place to a second. Now two dozen of these dreadful lashes have been inflicted. The lacerated back looks inhuman. It resembles roasted meat burnt nearly black before a scorching fire. Yet still the lashes fall. The captain continues merciless. The executioners keep on. Four dozen strokes have cut up his flesh and robbed him of all self-respect. There he hangs, a pitied, self-despised, groaning, bleeding wretch. And now the captain cries, Forbear! His shirt is thrown over his shoulders. The seizings are loosed. He is led away, staining his path with red drops of blood. And the hands, piped down by the boatswain, sullenly return to their duties. Such was the scene witnessed on board the Macedonian on the passage from London to Spithead. Such, substantially, is every punishment seen at sea, only carried sometimes to a greater length of severity. Sad and sorrowful were my feelings on witnessing it. Thoughts of the friendly warnings of my old acquaintance filled my mind, and I inwardly wished myself once more under the friendly roof of my father at Bladen. Vain wish! I should have believed the warning voice when it was given. Note. In the British Royal Navy there have been vast improvements since the period here referred to, and flogging has been abolished by the Act of 1881. Though I have spoken severely of the officers of the Navy, let it not be thought that the whole class of naval officers are lost to the finer feelings of humanity. There are many humane, considerate men among them who deserve our highest respect. This was the case with the first lieutenant of the Macedonian, Mr. Scott. He abhorred flogging. Once when a poor marine was under sentence, he pled hard and successfully with the captain for his respite. This was a great victory, for the captain had a profound hatred of marines. The poor soldier was extremely grateful for his intercession, and would do anything for him to show his sense of the obligation. Our frigate had orders to convey between two and three hundred troops from Portsmouth to Lisbon to assist the Portuguese against the French. The soldiers were stowed on the main decks, with very few conveniences for the voyage. Their officers messed and berthed in the wardroom. Having taken them on board, we again weighed anchor, and were soon careening before the breeze on our way to Lisbon. As usual, we who were landsmen had our share of that merciless disease, seasickness. As usual, we wished the foolish wish that we had never come to sea. As usual, we got over it, and laughed at ourselves for our seasick follies. Our good ship paid little attention, however, to our feelings. She kept along on her bounding way, and after a week at sea we were greeted with a pleasant cry of Land Ho! from the masthead. As it was now near night, we lay off and on until morning. At daybreak we fired a gun for a pilot. The wind being nearly dead ahead, we had to beat about nearly all day. Towards night it became fair, and we ascended the Tagus. This river is about nine miles wide at its mouth, and is four hundred and fifty miles in length. It has a very rapid current with steep, fertile banks. Aided by a fine breeze, we ascended it in splendid style, passed a half-moon battery, then shot past Bellum Castle into the port of Lisbon, about ten miles from its mouth. Here we found a spacious harbor filled with shipping. Besides numerous merchantmen, there were two ships of a hundred guns, several seventy-fours, frigates, and sloops of war, with a large number of transports, all designed for the defense of Lisbon against the French. After lying some time at Lisbon, we proceeded on a cruise to the Spanish coast, and returned to our station. We were shortly ordered on another cruise, and, being in want of men, we resorted to the press-gang which was made up of our boldest men armed to the teeth. 
by their aid we obtained our full numbers among the merchant seamen taken were a few americans who were seized in spite of their protections which were often taken from them and destroyed some were released through the influence of the american consul others less fortunate were carried to sea to their no small chagrin the duties of the press gang being completed we once more weighed anchor and were soon careening before the gales of the bay of biscay a few days after we had fairly got out to sea the thrilling cry of a man overboard ran through the ship it was followed by another cry of heave out a rope then by still another of cut away the life buoy then came the order lower a boat notwithstanding the rapidity of these commands and the confusion occasioned by the anticipated loss of a man they were rapidly obeyed the ship was then hove to but the cause of all this excitement was already a considerable distance from the ship it was a poor swede named luckholm who while engaged in lashing the larboard anchor stock lost his hold and fell into the sea he could not swim but somehow he managed to keep afloat until the boat reached him when he began to sink the man at the bow ran his boat hook down and caught the drowning man by his clothes these however tearing he lost his hold and the unfortunate swede sunk once more again the active bowsman ran the hook down leaning far over the side and he now luckily got hold of his shirt collar dripping and apparently lifeless they drew him into the boat he was soon under the care of the surgeon who restored him to animation it was a narrow escape we now reached the island of madeira and thence crossed the atlantic to the coast of virginia about this time the prevailing topic of conversation among our men and officers was the probability of a war with america and a feeling of our own success was confidently entertained as yet however there were no hostilities and our vessel returned first to lisbon and then to england for some time we lay at plymouth where the vessel was repaired and newly painted after these and other preparations for another cruise were completed the hoarse voice of the boatswain rang through the ship crying all hands up anchor ahoy in an instant the capstan bars were shipped the fifer was at his station playing a lively tune the boys were on the main deck holding on to the nippers ready to pass them to the men who put them round the messenger and cable then amid the cries of walk round heave away my lads accompanied by the shrill music of the fife the anchor rose from its bed and was soon dangling under our bows the sails were then shaken out the ship brought before the wind and we were once more on our way to sea we were directed to cruise off the coast of france this time where as we were then at war with the french we were likely to find active service we first made the french port of rochelle from thence we sailed to brest which was closely blockaded by a large british fleet consisting of one three-decker with several seventy-fours besides frigates and small craft we joined this fleet and came to an anchor in basque roads to assist in the blockade our first object was to bring a large french fleet greatly superior to us in size and numbers to an engagement with all our maneuvering we could not succeed in enticing them from their snug berth in the harbor of brest where they were safely moored defended by a heavy fort and by a chain crossing the harbor to prevent the ingress of any force that might be bold enough to attempt to cut them out sometimes we sent a frigate or two as near their fort as they dared to venture in order to entice them out at other times the whole fleet would get under way and stand out to sea but without success the frenchmen were either afraid we had a larger armament than was visible to them or they had not forgotten the splendid victories of nelson at the nile and trafalgar whatever they thought they kept their ships beyond the reach of our guns sometimes however their frigates would creep outside the fort when we gave them chase but seldom went beyond the exchange of a few harmless shots this was what our men called boys play and they were heartily glad when we were ordered to return to plymouth after just looking into plymouth harbor our orders were countermanded and we returned to the coast of france having accomplished about one half the distance the man at the masthead cried out sail ho where away what direction responded the officer of the deck 
the man having replied the officer again asked what does she look like she looks small i cannot tell sir in a few minutes the officer hailed again by shouting masthead there what does she look like she looks like a small sailboat sir this was rather a novel announcement for what could a small sailboat do out on the wide ocean but a few minutes convinced us that it was even so for from the deck we could see a small boat with only a man and a boy on board they proved to be two french prisoners of war who had escaped from an english prison and having stolen a small boat were endeavoring to make this perilous voyage to their native home poor fellows they looked sadly disappointed at finding themselves once more in british hands they had already been in prison for some time they were now doomed to go with us in sight of their own sunny france and then be torn away again carried to england and imprisoned until the close of the war no wonder they looked sorrowful when after having hazarded life for home and liberty they found both snatched from them in a moment by their unlucky rencontre with our frigate i am sure we should all have been glad to have missed them but this is only one of the consequences of war end of chapter two flogging a foreign cruise section seven of the mutiny of the bounty and other narratives by william bly this librivox recording is in the public domain life of a sailor boy chapter three captured by an american vessel the horrors of war read by john greenman having joined the blockading fleet again we led the same sort of life as before now at anchor then giving chase now standing in shore and anon standing out to sea firing and being fired at without once coming into action determined to accomplish some exploit or other our captain ordered an attempt to be made at cutting out some of the french small craft that lay in shore we were accustomed to send out our barges almost every night in search of whatever prey they might capture but on this occasion the preparations were more formidable than usual the oars were muffled the boat's crew increased and every man was armed to the teeth the cots were got ready on board in case any of the adventurers should return wounded cots are used to sleep in by wardroom officers and captains midshipmen and sailors using hammocks but a number of the cots are always kept in a vessel of war for the benefit of wounded men they differ from the hammock in being square at the bottom and consequently more easy notwithstanding these expressive preparations the brave fellows went off in as fine spirits as if they had been going on shore to enjoy themselves such is the contempt of danger that prevails among sailors we had no tidings of this adventure until morning when i was startled by hearing three cheers from the watch on deck these were answered by three more from a party that seemed approaching us i ran on deck just as our men came alongside with their bloodless prize a lugger laden with french brandy wine and castile soap they had made this capture without difficulty for the crew of the lugger made their escape in a boat on the first intimation of danger though without any positive information we now felt pretty certain that our government was at war with america among other things our captain appeared more anxious than usual he was on deck almost all the time the lookout aloft was more rigidly observed, and every little while the cry of "Masthead there!" arrested our attention. It is customary in men of war to keep men at the fore and main mastheads, whose duty it is to give notice of every new object that may appear. They are stationed in the royal yards if they are up, but if not, on the top gallant yards. At night, a lookout is kept on the foreyard only thus we passed several days the captain running up and down and constantly hailing the man at the masthead early in the morning he began his charge to keep a good lookout and continued to repeat it until night indeed he seemed almost crazy with some pressing anxiety sunday december twenty fifth eighteen twelve came and it brought with it a stiff breeze we usually made a sort of holiday of this sacred day 
After breakfast it was common to muster the entire crew on the spar-deck, dressed as the fancy of the captain might dictate. Sometimes in blue jackets and white trousers, or blue jackets and blue trousers. At other times in blue jackets, scarlet vest, and blue or white trousers, with our bright anchor buttons glancing in the sun, and our black glossy hats ornamented with black ribbons, and with the name of our ship painted on them. After muster we frequently had church service read by the captain. The rest of the day was devoted to idleness. But we were destined to spend the Sabbath just introduced to the reader in a very different manner. We had scarcely finished breakfast before the man at the masthead shouted, "'Sail ho!' The captain rushed upon deck, exclaiming, "'Masthead there! Sir, where away is the sail?' The precise answer to this question I do not recollect, but the captain proceeded to ask, "'What does she look like?' "'A square-rigged vessel, sir,' was the reply of the lookout. After a few minutes the captain shouted again, "'Masthead there! Sir, what does she look like?' "'A large ship, sir, standing toward us!' By this time most of the crew were on deck, eagerly straining their eyes to obtain a glimpse of the approaching ship, and murmuring their opinions to each other on her probable character. Then came the voice of the captain, shouting, "'Keep silence, fore and aft!' Silence being secured, he hailed the lookout, who, to his question of, "'What does she look like?' replied, "'A large frigate bearing down upon us, sir!' A whisper ran along the crew that the stranger ship was a Yankee frigate. The thought was confirmed by the command of, "'All hands clear the ship for action, ahoy!' The drum and fife beat to quarters, bulkheads were knocked away, the guns were released from their confinement, the whole dread paraphernalia of battle were produced and after the lapse of a few minutes of hurry and confusion, every man and boy was at his post, ready to do his best service for his country, except the band, who, claiming exemption from the affray, safely stowed themselves away in the cable tier. We had only one sick man on the list, and he, at the cry of battle, hurried from his cot, feeble as he was, to take his post of danger. A few of the junior midshipmen were stationed below on the berth deck, with orders given, in our hearing, to shoot any man who attempted to run from his quarters. As the approaching ship showed American colors, all doubt of her character was at an end. We must fight her, was the conviction of every breast. Every possible arrangement that could ensure success was accordingly made. The guns were shotted, the matches lighted, for although our guns were all furnished with first-rate locks, they were also provided with matches, attached by lanyards in case the lock should misfire. A lieutenant then passed through the ship, directing the marines and boarders, who were furnished with pikes, cutlasses, and pistols, how to proceed if it should be necessary to board the enemy. He was followed by the captain, who exhorted the men to fidelity and courage, urging upon their consideration the well-known motto of the brave Nelson, "'England expects every man to do his duty.' In addition to all these preparations on deck, some men were stationed in the tops with small arms, whose duty it was to attend to trimming the sails, and to use their muskets provided we came to close action. There were others also below, called sail-trimmers, to assist in working the ship should it be necessary to shift her position during the battle. My station was at the fifth gun on the main deck. It was my duty to supply my gun with powder, a boy being appointed to each gun in the ship on the side we engaged for this purpose. A woolen screen was placed before the entrance to the magazine, with a hole in it through which the cartridges were passed to the boys. We received them there, and, covering them with our jackets, hurried to our respective guns. These precautions are observed to prevent the powder taking fire before it reaches the gun. Thus we all stood, awaiting orders, in motionless suspense. At last we fired three guns from the larboard side of the main deck. This was followed by the command— cease firing you are throwing away your shot then came the order to wear ship and prepare to attack the enemy with our starboard guns soon after this i heard a firing from some other quarter which i at first supposed to be a discharge from our quarter-deck guns but it proved to be the roar of the enemy's cannon a strange noise such as i had never heard before next arrested my attention it sounded like the tearing of sails just over our heads this I soon ascertained to be the wind of the enemy's shot. The firing, after a few minutes' cessation, recommenced. 
the roaring of cannon could now be heard from all parts of our trembling ship and mingling as it did with that of our foes it made a most hideous noise by and by i heard the shot strike the sides of our ship the whole scene grew indescribably confused and horrible it was like some awfully tremendous thunderstorm whose deafening roar is attended by incessant streaks of lightning carrying death in every flash and strewing the ground with the victims of its wrath only in our case the scene was rendered more horrible than that by the presence of torrents of blood which dyed our decks though the recital may be painful yet as it will reveal the horrors of war and show at what a fearful price a victory is won or lost i will present the reader with things as they met my eye during the progress of this dreadful fight i was busily supplying my gun with powder when i saw blood suddenly fly from the arm of a man stationed at our gun i saw nothing strike him the effect alone was visible in an instant the third lieutenant tied his handkerchief round the wounded arm and sent the poor fellow below to the surgeon the cries of the wounded now rang through all parts of the ship these were carried to the cockpit as fast as they fell while those more fortunate men who were killed outright were immediately thrown overboard as i was stationed but a short distance from the main hatchway i could catch a glance at all who were carried below a glance was all i could indulge in for the boys belonging to the guns next to mine were wounded in the early part of the action and i had to spring with all my might to keep three or four guns supplied with cartridges i saw two of these lads fall nearly together one of them was struck in the leg by a large shot he had to suffer amputation above the wound the other had a grape or canister shot sent through his ankle a stout yorkshireman lifted him in his arms and hurried him to the cockpit he had his foot cut off and was thus made lame for life two of the boys stationed on the quarter-deck were killed they were both portuguese a man who saw one of them killed afterwards told me that his powder caught fire and burnt the flesh almost off his face in this pitiable situation the agonized boy lifted up both hands as if imploring relief when a passing shot instantly cut him in two i was an eye-witness to a sight equally revolting a man named aldridge had one of his hands cut off by a shot and almost at the same moment he received another shot which tore open his bowels in a terrible manner as he fell two or three men caught him in their arms and as he could not live threw him overboard one of the officers in my division also fell in my sight he was a noble-hearted fellow named nan kivel a grape or canister shot struck him near the heart he fell and was carried below where he shortly after died mr scott our first lieutenant was also slightly wounded by a grummet or a small iron ring probably torn from a hammock clue by a shot he went below shouting to the men to fight on having had his wound dressed he came up again shouting to us at the top of his voice and bidding us fight with all our might the battle went on our men kept cheering with all their might i cheered with them though i confess i scarcely knew for what certainly there was nothing very inspiriting in the aspect of things where i was stationed so terrible had it been the work of destruction round us that it was termed the slaughter-house not only had we had several boys and men killed or wounded but several of the guns were disabled the one i belonged to had a piece of muzzle knocked out and when the ship rolled it struck a beam of the upper deck with such force as to become jammed and fixed in that position a twenty-four pound shot had also gone through the screen of the magazine immediately over the orifice through which we passed our powder the schoolmaster received a death wound the brave boatswain who came from the sick cot to the din of battle was fastening a stopper on a backstay which had been shot away when his head was smashed to pieces by a cannon-ball another man going to complete the unfinished task was also struck down one of our midshipmen likewise received a severe wound and the wardroom steward was killed a fellow named john who for some petty offence had been sent on board as a punishment was carried past me wounded i distinctly heard the large blood drops fall pat 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 on the deck his wounds were mortal even a poor goat kept by the officers for her milk did not escape the general carnage her hind legs were shot off 
and poor Nan was thrown overboard. I have often been asked what were my feelings during this fight. I felt pretty much as I suppose every one does at such a time. That men are without thought when they stand amid the dying and the dead is too absurd an idea to be entertained for a moment. We all appeared cheerful, but I know that many a serious thought ran through my mind. Still, what could we do but keep up a semblance, at least, of animation? To run from our quarters would have been certain death from the hands of our own officers. To give way to the gloom or to show fear would do no good, and might brand us with the name of cowards and ensure certain defeat. Our only true philosophy, therefore, was to make the best of our situation by fighting bravely and cheerfully. I thought a great deal, however, of the other world. Every groan, every falling man, told me that the next instant I might be before the judge of all the earth. While these thoughts secretly agitated my bosom, the din of battle continued. Grape and canister shot were pouring through our portholes like leaden rain, carrying death in their train. The large shot came against the ship's side like iron hail, shaking her to the very keel, or passing through her timbers and scattering terrific splinters, which did a more appalling work than even their own death-giving blows. The reader may form an idea of the effect of grape and canister when he is told that grape shot is formed by seven or eight balls confined to an iron and tied in a cloth. These balls are scattered by the explosion of the powder. Canister shot is made by filling a powder canister with balls, each as large as two or three musket balls. These also scatter with direful effect when discharged. What then with splinters, cannonballs, grape, and canister poured incessantly upon us, the reader may be assured that the work of death went on in a manner which must have been satisfactory even to the king of terrors himself. Suddenly the rattling of the iron hail ceased. We were ordered to cease firing. A profound silence ensued, broken only by the stifled groans of the brave sufferers below. It was soon ascertained that the enemy had shot ahead to repair damages, for she was not so disabled but she could sail without difficulty, while we were so cut up that we lay utterly helpless. Our head-braces were shot away, the fore and main-top masts were gone, the mizzen-mast hung over the stern, having carried several men over in its fall. We were in the state of a complete wreck. A council was now held among the officers on the quarter-deck. Our condition was perilous in the extreme. Victory or escape was alike hopeless. Our ship was disabled. Many of our men were killed, and many more wounded. The enemy would without doubt bear down upon us in a few moments, and as she could now choose her own position, would doubtless rake us fore and aft. Any further resistance was therefore folly. So, in spite of the hot-brained lieutenant, who advised them not to strike, but to sink alongside, it was determined to strike our colors. This was done by the hands of a brave fellow named Watson, whose saddened brow told how severely it pained his lion heart to do it. To me it was a pleasing sight, for I had seen fighting enough for one Sabbath, more than I wished to see again on a weekday. His Britannic Majesty's frigate Macedonian was now the prize of the American frigate United States. I now went below to see how matters appeared there. The first object I met was a man bearing a limb, which had just been detached from some poor sufferer. Pursuing my way to the wardroom, I necessarily passed through the steerage, which was strewed with the wounded. It was a sad spectacle, made more appalling by the groans and cries which rent the air. Some were groaning, others were swearing most bitterly, a few were praying, while those last arrived were begging most piteously to have their wounds dressed next. The surgeon and his mate were smeared with blood from head to foot. They looked more like butchers than doctors. Having so many patients, they had once shifted their quarters from the cockpit to the steerage. They now removed to the wardroom, and the long table, round which the officers had sat over many a merry feast, was soon covered with the bleeding forms of maimed and mutilated seamen. I now set to work to render all the aid in my power to the sufferers. Our carpenter, named Reed, had his leg cut off. I helped to carry him to the after-ward room. 
but he soon breathed out his life there, and then I assisted in throwing his mangled remains overboard. We got out the cots as fast as possible, for most of the men were stretched out on the gory deck. One poor fellow who lay with a broken thigh begged me to give him water. I gave him some. He looked unutterable gratitude, drank, and died. It was with exceeding difficulty I moved through the steerage. It was so covered with mangled men, and so slippery with streams of blood. There was a poor boy there crying as if his heart would break. He had been servant to the boatswain, whose head was dashed to pieces. Poor boy, he felt that he had lost a friend. I tried to comfort him by reminding him that he ought to be thankful for having escaped death himself. Here I also met one of my messmates, who showed the utmost joy at seeing me alive, for he said he had heard that I was killed. He was looking up his messmates, which he said was always done by sailors. We found two of our mess wounded. One was the Swede, Lockholm, who fell overboard and was nearly lost, as formerly mentioned. We held him while the surgeon cut off his leg above the knee. The operation was most painful to behold, the surgeon using his knife and saw on human flesh and bones as freely as the butcher at the shambles does on the carcass of a beast. Our other messmates suffered still more than the Swede. He was sadly mutilated about the legs and thighs with splinters. Such scenes of suffering as I saw in that wardroom I hope never to witness again. Could the civilized world behold them as they were, and as they often are, infinitely worse than on that occasion, it seems to me that they would forever put down the barbarous practices of war by universal consent. Most of our officers and men were taken on board the victor ship. I was left, with a few others, to take care of the wounded. My master, the sailing-master, was also among the officers who continued in the ship. Most of the men who remained were unfit for any service, having broken into the spirit-room and made themselves drunk. Some of them broke into the purser's room and helped themselves to clothing, while others, by previous agreement, took possession of their dead messmates' property. For my own part, I was content to help myself to a little of the officer's provisions, which did me more good than could be obtained from rum. What was worse than all, however, was the folly of the sailors in giving spirits to their wounded messmates, since it only served to aggravate their distress. The great number of the wounded kept our surgeon and his mate busily employed until late at night, and it was a long time before they had much leisure. I remember passing round the ship the day after the battle. Coming to a hammock, I found someone in it, apparently asleep. I spoke. He made no answer. I looked into the hammock. He was dead. My messmates, coming up, we threw the corpse overboard. That was no time for useless ceremony. The man had probably crawled into his hammock the day before, and, not being perceived in the general distress, bled to death. O oh, war! Who can reveal thy miseries? End of chapter 3 This is section 8 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, Chapter 4. Sailor Life in the American Service. Read by John Greenman. When the crew of the United States first boarded our frigate to take possession of her and their prize, our men, heated with the fury of the battle, exasperated with the sight of their dead and wounded shipmates, and rendered furious by the rum they had obtained from the spirit-room, felt and exhibited some disposition to fight their captors. But after the confusion had subsided, and part of our men were snugly stowed away in the American ship, and the remainder found themselves kindly used in their own, the utmost good feeling began to prevail. We set to work to cleanse the ship, using hot vinegar to take out the scent of the blood, that had dyed the white of our planks with crimson. We also aided in fitting our disabled frigate for her voyage. This being accomplished, both ships sailed in company toward the American coast. I soon felt myself perfectly at home with the American seamen, so much so that I chose to mess with them. My shipmates also participated in similar feelings in both ships. 
all idea that we had been trying to shoot each other so shortly before seemed forgotten. We ate together, drank together, joked, sung, laughed, told yarns. In short, a perfect union of ideas, feelings, and purposes seemed to exist among all hands. A corresponding state of unanimity existed, I was told, among the officers. Our voyage was one of considerable excitement. The seas swarmed with British cruisers, and it was extremely doubtful whether the United States would elude their grasp and reach the protection of an American port with her prize. I hoped most sincerely to avoid them, as did most of my old shipmates. In this we agreed with our captors, who wisely desired to dispose of one conquest before they attempted another. Our former officers, of course, were anxious for the sight of a British flag, but we saw none. And after a prosperous voyage from the scene of conflict, we heard the welcome cry of, Land Ho! The United States entered the port of New London, but owing to a sudden shift of the wind, the Macedonian had to lie off and on for several hours. Had an English cruiser found us in this situation, we would have been easily recovered. And as it was extremely probable we should fall in with one, I felt quite uneasy, until after several hours we made out to run into the pretty harbor of Newport. We fired a salute as we came to anchor, which was promptly returned by the people on shore. While we lay here a few days, several of our men contrived to run away. I would have done so, too, but for the vigilance of the prize officers, who were ordered to keep us, that we might be exchanged for those Americans who had fallen into British hands. My desire for freedom at length prevailed over prudence, and I made my escape, glad to be rid of the tyranny to which I had been so long exposed. But this step, which, on reflection, I do not commend, brought another evil. I was destitute of any means of support, and after numerous ineffectual efforts to get employment on land, I again took to a seafaring life, this time, however, entering myself on board a United States brig of war, the Siren, carrying sixteen guns. I was then in the seventeenth year of my life. I was recommended by acquaintances to ship myself under a false name, but in defiance of my fears I entered under my own proper name of Samuel Leach. My first impressions of the American service were very favorable. The treatment in the Siren was more lenient than in the Macedonian. The captain and officers were kind, while there was a total exemption from that petty tyranny exercised by the upstart midshipmen in the British service. As a necessary effect, our crew were as comfortable and happy as men ever are in a man of war. Our brig had before this taken in her guns, consisting of two long nine-pounders, twelve twenty-four-pound carronades, and two forty-two-pounders. Our crew was composed of about one hundred and twenty-five smart, active men. We were all supplied with stout leathern caps, something like those used by firemen. These were crossed by two strips of iron covered with bearskin, and were designed to defend the head, in boarding an enemy ship, from the stroke of the cutlass. Strips of bearskin were likewise used to fasten them on, serving the purpose of false whiskers, and causing us to look as fierce as hungry wolves. We were also frequently exercised in the various evolutions of a sea-fight, first using our cannon, then seizing our cutlasses and boarding-pikes, and cutting to the right and left, as if in the act of boarding an enemy's ship. Thus we spent our time from early in the fall until after Christmas, when we received orders to hold ourselves in readiness for sea. As we lay waiting for our final orders, a report reached us that a large English brig of war called the Nimrod lay in a cove somewhere near Boston Bay. Upon this information our officers planned a night expedition for the purpose of effecting her capture. Our intended mode of attack was to run close alongside, pour a broadside upon her, and then, without further ceremony, board her cutlass in hand. So we took in our powder, ground up our cutlasses, and towards night got under way. A change in the wind, however, defeated our designs, and we put into Salem Harbor, with no other result than the freezing of a man's fingers, which happened while we were furling our sails. Thus ended our first warlike expedition in the Siren. 
Shortly after this affair, we received orders to start on a cruise to the coast of Africa, and in company with the Grand Turk, a privateer, set sail from Salem. Passing the fort, we received the usual hail from the sentry of, Brig ahoy! Where are you bound to? To this salutation the first lieutenant jocosely answered, There and back again, on a man-of-war's cruise! Such a reply would not have satisfied a British soldier, but we shot past the fort, unmolested. After two days we parted company with the Grand Turk, and by the aid of a fair wind soon found ourselves in the Gulf Stream, where, instead of fearing frozen fingers, we could go barefooted and feel quite comfortable. We now kept a sharp lookout at the masthead, but met with nothing until we reached the Canary Islands, near which we saw a boatload of Portuguese, who, coming alongside, talked in their native tongue with great noise and earnestness, but were no more intelligible to us than so many blackbirds. While off the African coast our captain died. His wasted body was placed in a coffin with shot to sink it. After the service had been read, the plank on which the coffin rested was elevated, and it slipped into the great deep. The yards were braced round, and we were under way again, when, to our surprise and grief, we saw the coffin floating on the waves. The reason was, the carpenter had bored holes in the top and bottom. He should have made them only in the top. After the funeral, the crew were called aft, and the first lieutenant, Mr. Nicholson, told us that it should be left to our decision whether he should assume the command and continue the cruise, or return home. We gave him three hearty cheers in token of our wish to continue the cruise. He was a noble-minded man, very kind and civil to his crew, and the opposite in every respect to the haughty, lordly captain with whom I first sailed in the Macedonian. Seeing me one day with rather a poor hat on, he called me aft and presented me with one of his own, but little worn. "'Good luck to him,' said I, in sailor phrase, as I returned to my messmates. We also lost two of our crew, who fell victims to the heat of the climate. One morning the cry of, "'Sail ho!' directed our attention to a strange sail which had hove to, with her courses hauled up. At first we took her for a British man-of-war brig. The hands were summoned to quarters, and the ship got ready for action. A nearer approach, however, convinced us that the supposed enemy— was no other than our old friend the Grand Turk. She did not appear to know us, for no sooner did she see that our craft was a brig of war than, supposing us to belong to John Bull, she crowded all her canvas and made the best of her way off. Knowing what she was, we permitted her to escape without further alarm. The first land we made was Cape Mount. The natives came off to a considerable distance in their canoes, clothed in nothing but a piece of cloth fastened round the waist, and extending downward to the feet. As we approached the shore we saw several fires burning. This, we were told, in the broken English spoken by our sable visitors, was the signal for trade. We bought a quantity of oranges, limes, coconuts, tamarinds, plantains, yams, and bananas. We likewise took in a quantity of cassada, a species of ground root, of which we made tolerable pudding and bread also a few hogs and some water. We lay here several days, looking out for any English vessels that might come thither for purposes of trade. Meanwhile we began to experience the inconvenience of a hot climate. Our men were covered with blotches or boils, probably occasioned by so sudden a transition from extreme cold to extreme heat. What was worse still, we were in want of a plentiful supply of water. In consequence of this, we were placed on an allowance of two quarts per diem to each man, which occasioned us much suffering, for after preparing our puddings, bread, and grog, we had but little left to assuage our burning thirst. Some, in their distress, drank large quantities of sea-water, which only increased their thirst, and made them sick. Others sought relief in chewing lead, tea-leaves, or anything which would create moisture. Never did we feel more delighted than when our boat's crew announced the discovery of a pool of fine, clear water. While cruising along the coast, we one night perceived a large ship lying at anchor near the shore. We could not decide whether she was a large merchantman or a man of war, so we approached her with the utmost caution. Our doubts were soon removed, for she suddenly loosed all her sails, 
and made chase after us. By the help of their glasses our officers ascertained her to be an English frigate. Of course it was folly to engage her, so we made all the sail we could carry, beat to quarters, lighted our matches, and lay down at our guns, expecting to be prisoners of war before morning. During the night we hung out false lights and altered our course. This baffled our pursuer. In the morning she was not to be seen. The next sail we made was not so formidable. She was an English vessel at anchor in Senegal River. We approached her and hailed. Her officer returned an insolent reply, which so exasperated our captain that he passed the word to fire into her, but recalled it almost immediately. The countermand was too late, for in a moment, everything being ready for action, we poured a whole broadside into our unfortunate foe. The current carried us away from the stranger. We attempted to beat up again, but our guns had roused the garrison in a fort which commanded the river, and they began to blaze away at us in so expressive a manner that we found it prudent to get a little beyond the reach of their shot, and patiently wait for daylight. The next morning we saw our enemy hauled close in shore, under the protection of the fort, and filled with soldiers. At first it was resolved to man the boats and cut her out, but this, after weighing the subject maturely, was pronounced to be too hazardous an experiment, and notwithstanding our men begged to make the attempt, it was wisely abandoned. How many were killed by our hasty broadside we never learned, but doubtless several poor fellows were hurried to a watery and unexpected grave, affording another illustration of the beauty of war. This affair our men humorously styled the Battle of Senegal. After visiting Cape Three Points, we shaped our course for St. Thomas. On our way we lost a prize through a display of Yankee cunning in her commander. We had hoisted English colors. The officer in command of the stranger was pretty well versed in the secrets of false colors, and in return he ran up the American flag. The bait took. Supposing her to be American, we showed the stars and stripes. This was all the merchant man desired. It told him what we were, and he made all possible sail for St. Thomas. We followed, crowding every stitch of canvas our brig could carry. We also got out our sweeps and swept her along, but in vain. The merchantman was the better sailor, and succeeded in reaching St. Thomas, which, being a neutral port, secured her safety. Her name was the Jane, of Liverpool. The next morning another Liverpool merchantman got into the harbor unseen by our lookout until she was under the protection of the laws of neutrality. Our next business was to watch the mouth of the harbor in the hope of catching them as they left port. But they were too cautious to run into danger, especially as they were expecting a convoy for their protection, which might make us glad to trust more to our canvas than to our cannon. Shortly after this occurrence we made another sail standing in toward St. Thomas. Hoisting English colors, our officers also donning the British uniform, we soon came near enough to hail her. For not doubting that we were a British brig, the merchantman made no effort to escape us. Our captain hailed her, "'Ship ahoy! Hello! What ship is that? The ship Barton! Where do you belong to? To Liverpool! What is your cargo? Redwood, palm oil, and ivory! Where are you bound to? To St. Thomas!' Just at that moment our English flag was hauled down, and to the inexpressible annoyance of the officers of the Barton, the stars and stripes supplied its place. "'Haul down your colors!' continued Captain Nicholson. The old captain, who up to this moment had been enjoying a comfortable nap in his very comfortable cabin, now came upon deck in his shirt-sleeves, rubbing his eyes, and looking so exquisitely ridiculous that it was scarcely possible to avoid laughing. So surprised was he at the unexpected termination of his dreams that he could not command skill enough to strike his colors, which was accordingly done by the mate. After taking out as much of her cargo as we desired, we proceeded to set her on fire. It was an imposing sight to behold the wild antics of the flames leaping from rope to rope and from spar to spar, until she looked like a fiery cloud resting on the dark surface of the water. Presently her spars began to fall, her masts went by the board, her loaded guns went off, the hull was burned to the water's edge, and what a few hours before was a fine trim ship, looking like a winged creature of the deep, 
lay a shapeless charred mass whose blackened outline shadowed in the clear still waves looked like the grim spirit of war lurking for its prey this wanton destruction of property was in accordance with our instructions to sink burn and destroy whatever we took from the enemy such is the war spirit sink burn and destroy how it sounds yet such are the instructions given by christian nations to their agents in time of war what christian will not pray for the destruction of such a spirit the crew of the barton we carried into st thomas and placed them on board the jane excepting a portuguese and two colored men who shipped among our crew we also took with us a fine black spaniel dog whom the men called by the name of paddy this done we proceeded to watch for fresh victims on which to wreak the vengeance of the war spirit the next sail we met was an english brig called the adventure which had a whole menagerie of monkeys on board we captured and burned her just as we did the barton her crew was also disposed of in the same manner one of them an african prince who had acquired a tolerable education in england and who was remarkably polite and sensible shipped in the siren his name was samuel quaqua we now remained at st thomas several days carrying on a petty trade with the natives our men bought all kinds of fruit gold dust and birds for these things we gave them articles of clothing tobacco knives etc for an old vest i obtained a large basketful of oranges for a handful of tobacco five large coconuts a profitable exchange on my side since although i drew my tobacco of the purser i fortunately never acquired the habit of using it a loss i never regretted my coconuts were far more gratifying and valuable when we got to sea parched with thirst and suffering for water than all the tobacco in the ship from st thomas we proceeded to angola where we stayed long enough to clean paint and refit our brig from stem to stern this was the last port we intended to touch at on the coast of africa our next anchorage was to be in boston harbor at least so we proposed but the events of war frustrated our intention to accomplish our object we had to run the gauntlet through the host of english cruisers that hovered about like birds of prey along both sides of the atlantic coast this enterprise appeared so impossible to my mind while we lay at angola and the fear of being retaken and hung operated so strongly on my imagination that more than once i determined to run away and find a refuge among the africans but my better judgment prevailed and i continued at my post still i used every possible precaution to escape detection in case of our capture in accordance with the custom of our navy at that period i let my hair grow long behind to change my looks more effectually instead of tying mine in a queue as the others did i let it hang in ringlets all around my face and neck this together with the effect of time caused me to appear quite a different lad from what i was when a boy on board the macedonian i also adopted that peculiarity of dress practiced by american men-of-war's men which consisted in wearing my shirt open at the neck with the corners thrown back on these corners a device was wrought consisting of the stars of the american flag with the british flag underneath by these means i hoped to pass for a genuine yankee without suspicion in case we should fall into english hands end of chapter four this is section nine of the mutiny of the bounty abridged from william bligh's narrative and other narratives by william bligh this librivox recording is in the public domain life of a sailor boy chapter five falls into english hands read by john greenman having finished our preparations we left angola for boston we reached the island of ascension in safety where was a post office of a truly patriarchal character a box is nailed to a post near the shore ships that pass send to the box and deposit or take out letters as the case may be this is probably the cheapest general post office establishment in the world we had scarcely left this island before the cry of sail ho arrested every ear supposing her to be a large merchantman we made towards her but a nearer approach made it doubtful whether she was an indian man 
or a man of war. The captain judged her to be the latter and tacked ship immediately. He was unwilling to place himself in the situation of an American privateer, who, mistaking a seventy-four for a merchantman, ran his ship close alongside, and boldly summoned her to haul down her colors. The captain of the other ship coolly replied, I am not in the habit of striking my colors. At the same moment the ports of his ship were opened, and disclosed her long ranges of guns yawning over the decks of the privateer. Perceiving his mistake, the privateer, with admirable tact and good humor, said, "'Well, if you won't, I will,' and pulling down his bunting, surrendered to his more powerful foe. To avoid such a mistake as this, our captain made all sail to escape the coming stranger, which was now bearing down upon us under a heavy pressure of canvas, revealing, as she gained upon our little brig, that she bore the formidable character of a seventy-four-gun ship under English colors. Of course, fighting was out of the question. It would be like the assault of a dog on an elephant, or a dolphin on a whale. We therefore crowded all possible sail, threw our guns, cables, anchors, hatches, etc., overboard, to increase her speed, but it soon became apparent that we could not escape. The wind blew quite fresh, which gave our opponent the advantage. She gained on us very fast. We shifted our course in hopes to baffle her until the night, when we felt pretty sure of getting out of her way. It was of no use she still gained, until we saw ourselves almost within gunshot of our opponent. In this extremity the captain ordered the quartermaster, George Watson, to throw the private signals overboard. This was a hard task for the bold-hearted fellow. As he pitched them into the sea, he said, "'Good-bye, brother Yankee,' an expression which, in spite of their mortifying situation, forced a smile from the lips of the officers. The sound of a gun now came booming through the air. It was a signal for us to heave to, or to look out for consequences. What might have been, we learned afterwards, for a division of the crew of the seventy-four had orders to sink us if we made the least show of resistance. Finding it useless to prolong the chase, our commander reluctantly ordered the flag to be struck. We then hove to, and our foe came rolling down upon us, looking like a huge avalanche rushing down the mountainside to crush some poor peasant's dwelling. Her officers stood on her quarter-deck, glancing unutterable pride, while her captain shouted, "'What brig is that?' "'The United States Brig Siren,' replied Captain Nicholson. "'This is His Britannic Majesty's ship Medway,' he answered. "'I claim you as my lawful prize.' Boats were then lowered, the little brig taken from us, and our crew transferred to the Medway, stowed away in the cable tier, and put in messes of twelve, with an allowance of only eight men's rations to a mess." a regulation which caused us considerable suffering from hunger. The sight of the marines on board the Medway made me tremble, for my fancy pointed out several of them as having formerly belonged to the Macedonian. I really feared I was destined speedily to swing at the yard-arm. It was, however, a groundless alarm. This event happened July 12, 1814. Only eight days before we had celebrated the independence of the United States. Now we had a fair prospect of a rigorous imprisonment. Such are the changes which constantly occur under the rule of the war spirit. The day subsequent to our capture, we were marched to the quarter-deck with our clothes-bags, where we underwent a strict search. We were ordered to remove our outside garments for this purpose. They expected to find us in possession of large quantities of gold-dust. What little our crew had purchased was taken from them, with a spirit of rapacity altogether beneath the dignity of a naval commander. Our short allowance was a source of much discomfort in this our prison ship, but in the true spirit of sailors we made even this the subject of coarse jests and pleasant remark. Enduring this evil we proceeded on our course. When the Medway arrived at Simonstown, about twenty-one miles from the Cape of Good Hope, we met the Denmark, seventy-four, on her way to England with prisoners from Cape Town. 
The captain had hitherto intended to land us at the latter place, but the presence of the Denmark led him to change his purpose and land us at Simonstown. The journey from this place to the Cape was one of great suffering to our crew. We were received on the beach by a file of Irish soldiers. Under their escort we proceeded seven miles through heaps of burning sand, seeing nothing worthy of notice on the way but a number of men busily engaged in cutting up dead whales on the seashore. After resting a short time we recommenced our march, guarded by a new detachment of soldiers. Unused to walking as we were, we began to grow excessively fatigued, and after wading a stream of considerable depth we were so overcome that it seemed impossible to proceed any farther. We lay down, discouraged and wretched, on the sand. The guard brought us some bread and gave a half-pint of wine to each man. This revived us somewhat. We were now placed under a guard of dragoons. They were very kind, and urged us to attempt the remaining seven miles. To relieve us they carried our clothes-bags on their horses, and overtaking some Dutch farmers going to the Cape with broom-stuff and brush, the officer of the dragoons made them carry the most weary among us in their wagons. It is not common for men to desire the inside of a prison, but I can assure my readers we did most heartily wish ourselves there on that tedious journey. At last, about nine o'clock p.m., we arrived at Cape Town, having left one of our number at Weinberg through exhaustion, who joined us the next day. Stiff, sore, and weary, we hastily threw ourselves on the hard boards of our prison, where, without needing to be soothed or rocked, we slept profoundly until late the next morning, when we took a survey of our new quarters. We found ourselves placed in a large yard, surrounded by high walls, and strongly guarded by soldiers. Within this enclosure there was a building, or shed, composed of three rooms, neither of which had any floor. Round the sides stood three benches, or stages, one above the other, to serve for berths. On these we spread our hammocks and bedclothes, making them tolerably comfortable places to sleep in. A few of the men preferred to sling their hammocks as they did at sea. Here also we used to eat, unless, as was our frequent practice, we did so in the open air. We remained in prison at the Cape till carried away in the ship Cumberland to England. Stopping by the way at St. Helena, we were removed to the Grampus, a transfer which greatly alarmed me, since the more men who saw me, the greater, of course, was my chance of detection. Luckily, no one knew me, and I arrived with my companions in safety at Plymouth. I was equally fortunate here, and remained undiscovered, till I was transferred with others to a vessel which was to take us in exchange to America. I pass over the circumstances of the voyage, and only mention that we were all landed in due time at New York. My resolution had been to quit the sea and settle down on land, but on returning to New York all such fancies vanished, as they had done before. I spent my hard-won earnings foolishly like others, and, like them, when reduced to straits, again sought employment as a sailor. On this occasion I shipped on board the Boxer, commanded by Captain Porter, a man, as it proved, of stern disposition. The Boxer was a brig-sloop, had, as I understand, been captured from the English a short time previously, and in a manner which I may describe as illustrative of naval warfare. The encounter took place at no great distance from Portland in the United States, on the 5th of September, 1813. The boxer, possessing twelve eighteen-pound carronades and two sixes, was commanded by Captain Blythe, and his antagonist, the American brig sloop Enterprise, commanded by Captain Burroughs, was armed with fourteen eighteen-pound carronades and two nines. Captain Blythe is spoken of as having been one of the bravest officers in the British service, and it is said that, prompted by the ardor of his temperament, he would encounter any foe, however great were the odds against him. In the beginning of August, 1811, when acting as first lieutenant of the Quebec, cruising between the Texel and Elbe, he volunteered with a small select party to cut out some French gunboats, 
and by the most daring intrepidity his enterprise was successful. For this gallant action he was promoted to the command of the boxer, which was by no means suited to his impetuous character. The boxer was one of a set of brigs which had been respectively named after favorite hounds of one of the lords of the admiralty, and built, as was afterwards discovered, on an improper model, whether as respects strength of timber or sailing powers. Eager to meet an enemy's ship, Captain Blythe, while lying off Portland, observed the enterprise approaching on the horizon, and immediately bore up to engage, leaving on shore the surgeon and two midshipmen who were away shooting pigeons. After maneuvering a few hours on various tacks to try rates of sailing, the two vessels, at a quarter past three in the afternoon, commenced firing at the distance of half pistol-shot apart. In the very first broadside, an eighteen-pound shot passed through Captain Blythe's body, and shattered his left arm, causing instant death. And about the same moment, a musket-ball fired from the boxer mortally wounded Captain Burroughs. The command of the boxer now devolved upon her only Lieutenant David McCreary, and that of the Enterprise on Lieutenant Edward McCall. At half-past three the Enterprise ranged ahead, and rounding to on the starboard tack, raked the boxer with starboard guns, and shot away her main top mast and fore topsail yard. The American then set her foresail, and, taking a position on the starboard bow of her now wholly unmanageable antagonist, continued pouring in successive raking fires until forty-five minutes past three, when the boxer surrendered. This defeat was caused not only by the damages done to the vessel, but by the weakened condition of the boxer's crew. The lieutenant commander, owing to the imprudent absence of the two midshipmen, had not an officer beneath him, and the master's mate and three seamen deserted their quarters during the action. Besides her commander, the boxer had three men killed and seventeen wounded, while the enterprise, besides her commander, had three or four killed and eleven wounded. The prize was carried into Portland, and there, on the 7th of September, the bodies of the two commanders were buried with military and civic honors. Refitted for the American service, the boxer was now ready for a cruise, and I prepared to do my duty on board as an ordinary seaman. Formerly I had been entered only as a boy, but now, as a rated seaman, I had a station assigned me in the foretop, instead of being a servant to any of the officers. I was also appointed to be one of the crew of the captain's gig. This made my lot one of more fatigue and exposure than in any former voyage, a proof of which I very soon experienced. It being now late in the fall, the weather became very cold. One afternoon, the pennant having got foul of the royal mast, an officer ordered me to go up and clear it. I had no mittens on, and it took me some time to perform my task, and before I came down one of my fingers was frozen. Thus it is, however, with the poor tar, and he thinks himself happy to escape with injuries so slight as this. We shortly received sailing orders, and were soon under way, bound to the Belize in the Gulf of Mexico. Here we cruised about some time, visiting New Orleans and other places, and keeping an outlook for pirates, with which these seas were then unhappily infested. This was a duty requiring great vigilance, and we were kept constantly at our posts. The most irksome duty of a sailor is to keep watch at night in the tops. Often I have stood for hours on the royal yard, or top-gallant yard, without a man to converse with. Here, overcome with fatigue and want of sleep, I have fallen into a dreamy dozing state, from which I was roused by a lee lurch of the ship. Starting up, I have shuddered at the danger I had so narrowly escaped. But notwithstanding this sudden fright, a few minutes had scarcely elapsed before I would be nodding again. This, of course, was a highly punishable offense. When the weather was rough, we were indulged with permission to stand on the foretopsail yard or on the topgallant cross trees, and if the ship rolled heavily, we lashed ourselves to the mast for safety. I can assure my readers there is nothing desirable in this part of a sailor's duty. In whatever the pleasure of a life at sea consists, it is not in keeping a lookout from the masthead at night. 
but the most disagreeable of all is to be compelled to stand on these crazy elevations when half dead with seasickness some suppose that sailors are never seasick after the first time they go to sea this is a mistake it is very much with them as with landsmen in respect to being sick in a coach those who are of bilious temperament are always affected more or less when they ride in a coach or sleigh while others are never sick on these occasions so with seamen some are never seasick others are sick only when going out of port while some are so in every gale of wind it is almost needless to say that for sailors no allowance is made for seasickness they must in all cases remain at their posts until it is time to be relieved end of chapter 5「This is section 10 of the Mutiny of the Bounty and other narratives by William Bly. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Life of a Sailor Boy, read by John Greenman. Chapter 6 Leaves the Service, Some Eminent Seamen. Our cruise terminated after a few skirmishes, and we returned to New York where I left the service, as I trusted for ever. As it occurred, my services as a seaman in a war vessel would not long have been required. The peace between England and France in 1814, by opening the continent to American commerce, hitherto excluded by British policy, naturally removed one of the grounds of quarrel, and opened the way for peace with the United States. On the 24th of December, 1814, a treaty of peace, accordingly, was effected at Ghent, which left, however, the question of right of search and other matters on the ground on which they had previously stood. The Americans were most successful in their naval warfare, but after all that was a trifling compensation for ruined commerce, and for being brought to the very verge of national dismemberment. In taking leave of the sea, it may be expected that I should say a few words respecting the life of a sailor. As I have already mentioned, the profession of a sailor has its hardships, but these were much greater at the time of my service than they are now. The duties of the men are now exactly regulated, and their comforts are cared for in many ways. On board of each vessel in the British Navy there are now means of instruction and a library, and the savings of the men are carefully secured for them, or transmitted to their wives or friends. On shore, also, there are at various ports establishments called sailors' homes, where discharged seamen may reside at a moderate expense till engaged in a new vessel. At sea, as on land, steadiness, temperance, good temper, forbearance, and other good qualities are sure to command respect, notwithstanding the severities of discipline. It is likewise most advantageous for a man to possess a good education, for the more he can make himself useful and be depended on, the greater is his chance of promotion. A properly bred sailor should, at the very least, be able to reef and steer, that is, adapt the sails to the wind whichever way it blows, and govern the vessel by the helm and compass. But besides these comparatively simple duties, he should likewise be able to throw and calculate by the log, to work a reckoning, take an observation, find the longitude, and keep a log-book in which all necessary particulars of the voyage are daily inscribed. The log is a contrivance for ascertaining the rate of speed at which a vessel goes. It consists of a long cord, having an oblong and loaded piece of wood attached to one end. This wood, when heaved overboard, remains stationary in the water, and consequently, as the vessel advances, the line must be let out from a reel held in the hand. The line is marked by knots and half-knots, representing miles and half-miles, and the number of these run off indicates the number of miles which the vessel is going at per hour. Every common seaman can cast the log and calculate the speed of the vessel from it, but few can do any more because they are contented to remain in ignorance and inclined to spend their leisure hour in trifling amusements rather than in study. Of course, such persons cannot expect to rise in their profession. 
It is astonishing how many cases are on record of individuals who, with scarcely any other education than what has been procured on shipboard, and while serving in subordinate and laborious situations, have attained distinction. The celebrated English navigator Dampier, although he had been some time at school before he left his native country, would have grown up in a state of ignorance had he not exerted himself in self-instruction after he went to sea. Davis, the discoverer of the strait which bears his name, also went to sea when quite a boy, and must have acquired all his knowledge, both of science and literary composition, while engaged with the duties of his profession. Every one is acquainted with Cook's humble origin and his distinguished career. By his own persevering efforts did this great man raise himself from the lowest obscurity to a reputation wide as the world itself. But, better still than all his fame, than either the honors he received while living or those which, when he was no more his country and mankind bestowed upon his memory, he had exalted himself in the scale of moral and intellectual being, had won for himself, by his unwearied striving, a new and nobler nature, and taken a high place among the instructors and benefactors of mankind. This alone is true temporal happiness, a reward of all labor and study and virtuous activity and endurance. Vancouver was a sailor formed under Cook, and to him we owe an interesting, ably written account of the voyage which he made round the world in 1790 and the four following years. Falconer, the author of The Shipwreck, a popular poem, spent his life from childhood at sea. Falconer did not permit the success of his poetical efforts to withdraw him from his profession, in which, having transferred himself from the merchant service to the navy, he continued to rise steadily till he was appointed purser of a man-of-war, one of the best situations in the Royal Navy, and which can be held only by a man of education. Robert Drury, who wrote an account of the island of Madagascar, and of his strange adventures there, was also a self-taught sailor. Drury was only fourteen years of age when he set out on his first voyage in a vessel proceeding to India, and he was shipwrecked in returning home on the island just mentioned, where he remained in captivity for fifteen years, so that when he at last contrived to make his escape, he had almost forgotten his native language. He afterwards, however, wrote an account of his shipwreck and residence in Madagascar, which remains a popular work till the present day. Other cases might be mentioned, but these are enough to show that the hardships of a sailor's life are no serious bar to improvement, provided he be true to himself, and be guided by a proper sense of duty. Unfortunately for myself, my neglect of moral improvement, the abandonment of my country's service, and my headlong folly and improvidence were errors now to be expiated. Having thrown myself adrift, with but slender resources and far distant from my friends, I experienced the fate of many a disbanded and penniless tar. What hand to turn to for the means of subsistence I knew not. Determined at any rate to make an effort, I went about to different parts of the country seeking employment. I was not successful, and at length my money was all gone, and my shoes more than half worn out. When reduced to this sad extremity, and on the brink of despair, I was so fortunate as to discover an old shipmate, and through his kind influence his brother-in-law employed me to work in his clothes-dressing establishment. As I was ignorant of the business, and was not really needed, my board was to be my only compensation. I lived here happily for some time, and then got employment of a more lucrative kind in another establishment, where I settled and have since remained thankful to have attained a haven of rest after the turmoils and dangers of a sea-life. Note, the foregoing narrative is abridged, with some alterations, from a small work entitled Thirty Years from Home, or A Voice from the Main Deck, being the experience of Samuel Leach, Boston, 1843. End of chapter 6, and end of Life of a Sailor Boy read by John Greenman. This is section 11 of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sunken Treasure, read by John Greenman. William Phipps was a poor man's son, and was born in the province of Maine, at the time when it was under British rule. In his boyhood and youth he used to tend sheep upon the hills, and until he had grown to be a man he did not even know how to read and write. Tired of tending sheep, he next apprenticed himself to a ship carpenter, and spent about four years at this work. In 1673, when he was twenty-two years old, he went to Boston, and soon afterwards was married to a rich widow. It was not long, however, before he lost all the money that he had acquired by his marriage, and became a poor man again. Still he was not discouraged. He often told his wife that, some time or other, he should be very rich, and would build a fair brick house in the Green Lane of Boston. Several years passed away, and William Phipps had not yet gained the riches which he promised to himself. During this time he had begun to follow the sea for a living. In the year 1684 he happened to hear of a Spanish ship which had been cast away near the Bahamas, and which was supposed to contain a great deal of gold and silver. Phipps went to the place in a small vessel but he did not succeed in fishing up gold and silver enough to pay the expenses of his voyage. But before he returned, he was told of another Spanish galleon, which, laden with immense treasure, had been cast away near Porto Plata. This ship had lain as much as fifty years beneath the waves, but though it was now an old story, and the most aged people had almost forgotten that such a vessel had been wrecked, Phipps resolved that the sunken treasure should again be brought to light. He went to London, and obtained admittance to King James. He told the king of the vast wealth that was lying at the bottom of the sea. King James appointed Phipps to be captain of a vessel called the Rose Algier, carrying eighteen guns and ninety-five men. Captain Phipps sailed from England in the Rose Algier, and cruised for nearly two years in the West Indies, endeavoring to find the wreck of the Spanish ship. It was all in vain. But before leaving the West Indies, he met with a Spaniard, an old man, who remembered the wreck of the Spanish ship, and gave him directions how to find the very spot. It was on a reef of rocks, the old man said, a few leagues from Porto Plata. On his arrival in England, Captain Phipps solicited the king to let him have another vessel, and send him back again to the West Indies. But King James, who had expected that the Rose Algier would return laden with gold, refused to do more. Phipps might never have been able to renew the search if the Goop of Albemarle and some other noblemen had not lent their assistance. They fitted out a ship, and gave the command to Captain Phipps. He sailed from England, and arrived safely at Porto Plata, where he assisted his men to build a large boat. The boat was intended for the purpose of going closer to the reef of rocks than a larger vessel could safely venture. When it was finished, the captain sent several men in it to examine the spot where the Spanish ship was said to have been wrecked. They were accompanied by some Indians who were skillful divers. The boat's crew proceeded to the reef of rocks but nothing could they see more valuable than a curious sea-shrub growing in a crevice of the reef of rocks. "'We won't go back empty-handed,' cried an English sailor, and then he spoke to one of the Indian divers. "'Dive down and bring me that pretty sea-shrub there. That's the only treasure we shall find.' Down plunged the diver, and soon rose dripping from the water, holding the sea-shrub in his hand. "'There are some ship's guns,' said he, the moment he had drawn breath, "'some great cannon among the rocks, near where the shrub was growing.' No sooner had he spoken than the English sailors knew that they had found the very spot where the Spanish galleon had been wrecked so many years before. The other Indian divers immediately plunged over the boat's side, and swam headlong down, groping among the rocks and sunken cannon." In a few moments one of them rose above the water with a heavy lump of silver in his arms. The single lump was worth more than a thousand dollars. The sailors took it into the boat, and then rowed back as speedily as they could to inform Captain Phipps of their good luck. "'That is lucky,' cries Captain Phipps. "'We shall every man of us make our fortunes.' 
Hereupon the captain and all the crew set to work with iron rakes and great hooks and lines, fishing for gold and silver at the bottom of the sea. Up came the treasure in abundance. Now they beheld a table of solid silver, once the property of an old Spanish grandee. Now they drew up a golden cup, fit for the king of Spain. Now their rakes or fishing lines were loaded with masses of silver bullion. There were also precious stones among the treasure, glittering and sparkling. After a day or two, Captain Phipps and his crew lighted on another part of the wreck, where they found a great many bags of silver dollars. But nobody could have guessed that these were money bags. By remaining so long in the salt water, they had become covered over with a crust-like stone, so that it was necessary to break them in pieces with hammers and axes. When this was done, a stream of silver dollars gushed out onto the deck of the vessel. The whole value of the recovered treasure, plate, bullion, precious stones, and all, was estimated at more than two millions of dollars. Captain Phipps and his men continued to fish up plate, bullion, and dollars as plentifully as ever, till their provisions grew short. Then, as they could not feed upon gold and silver, Phipps returned to England, where he was received with great joy by the Duke of Albemarle and other English lords who had fitted out the vessel. The captain's share was enough to make him comfortable for the rest of his days. It also enabled him to fulfill his promise to his wife by building a fair brick house in the Green Lane of Boston. Before Captain Phipps left London, King James made him a knight, so that, instead of the obscure ship-carpenter who had formerly dwelt among them, the inhabitants of Boston welcomed him on his return as the rich and famous Sir William Phipps. End of The Sunken Treasure And end of The Mutiny of the Bounty and Other Narratives by William Bly 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 by William Bly, 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 by William Bly.